I don't think there's anything more beautiful than a cemetery in the fall. Though I love cemeteries no matter the season. There's normally an abundance of majestically tall trees. More than you typically find in a public park. But not so many that they obstruct your view like in the woods. At the peak of autumn, you're treated to a panoramic vista of vibrantly colored foliage dangling from the branches and blanketing the ground, rustling in the wind and crunching underfoot. The gravestones themselves have an apothic allure to them, ruggedly cut slabs of polished slate or granite or marble, their dark bodies glistening ever so slightly in the dampled sunlight, meticulously arranged row by row in solemn respect to those they stand in memorial to. What I love the most, though, is the serenity the tranquility, the quiet. Aside from the occasional funeral, they're often entirely empty of visitors and virtually never have more than a few at a time. The memento mori of rotting corpses only six feet underground must sour most people in the otherwise gorgeous landscaping. Not me though. I guess I'm something of a misanthropic loner to seek out solitude in the confines of a graveyard. But reminders of mortality don't bother me. It's comforting, if anything, that we set aside such charming sanctuaries for the dead. It was on the first day of October 2018 that I came across a new cemetery, one I had never been to before or even knew existed. I was taking a scenic route home along the countryside roads to admire the fall landscape when I spotted the weathered gravestones up ahead. Pleasantly surprised at my discovery, I turned in without a second thought. The corroded metal arch over the gate's only red cemetery. If the sign had ever borne a name, those letters had long since rusted away. It wasn't a large cemetery, maybe a little over a hundred yards across by a couple hundred long, with a single looping gravel path. So I parked my car and explored it on foot. I was immediately enthralled by its pristine silence. I couldn't hear even the most distant sign of human activity. The only noises were the cawing of crows, the scampering of small animals, and the wind blowing through the trees. The towering oaks and maples that populated the graveyard were stunningly dressed in their fall colors beneath the somber gray sky. But the gravestones themselves were a different story. None of them were recent, and most were so worn they couldn't even be read anymore. There were only two structures still standing upon the grounds. The dilapidated remains of a maintenance shed and a small marble mausoleum. My entrance barred by an iron gate. I walked the entire length of the cemetery, searching for any sign of recent activity. Plant overgrowth was limited, but that looked more like the work of grazing wildlife than a groundskeeper. And I came to the conclusion the place must be abandoned. I was ecstatic, a small, quaint, aged cemetery all to myself. I came back a couple of days later and reclined up against a large gravestone that I thought gave the best view, with a book in one hand and a pumpkin spice latte in the other. I wasn't usually so casual about my behavior in cemeteries, in case someone came across me and deemed it disrespectful, but after a brief web search on Akashia yielded absolutely nothing about the cemetery, I was certain it was abandoned. If there's one thing people find creepier than cemeteries, it's abandoned, isolated, decaying cemeteries. I was quite confident that I wouldn't be bothered, and that the long-forgotten person beneath me would be grateful for any attention at all after such prolonged neglect. Once I had finished my drink and a couple of chapters of my book, I decided to get up and stretch my legs a bit. I nearly screamed out loud when I saw a man in a long black coat and wide-brimmed hat standing over a grave near the cemetery exit. In a more ordinary cemetery, his presence wouldn't have been much cause for concern. But I was so utterly convinced that this place had been abandoned for ages that it seemed next to impossible that he was just paying his respects. My mind immediately assumed the worst, that he had seen me come in here and hoped to take advantage of my isolated state. If I were to scream at the top of my lungs out here, would anyone else even hear it? I dropped back down behind the gravestone, waiting to see what he would do. He continued standing over the same grave, barely moving, and giving no indication that he even knew I was there. I pulled out my phone in the hopes of calling someone to pick me up, only to see that I had no reception. Not entirely unexpected, given the rural area I was in, but I still cursed my luck. 20 minutes to half an hour went by with no change, and I realized it was going to start getting dark soon. I decided it was better to walk past this guy in daylight than to risk being trapped with him in a graveyard at night. And it wasn't like I was completely defenseless either. Being a woman with a penchant for walking by herself in lonely areas, I had made it a habit to carry a small can of mace on my person. 
and I had taken some basic self-defense classes. Gathering my things with my mace concealed in the palm of my hand, I set off towards the exit, following the route that kept me the furthest from the stranger. I kept my gait steady, my breathing soft and level, and my gaze ever flickering back and forth between my car and the dark figure. At the sound of my footfalls drawing near, he listlessly lifted his head, gave a perfunctory nod and, to my great relief, let me pass without incident. A few days went by before I went back to the cemetery. My encounter with a stranger left me a bit spooked, but since he'd done nothing to actually threaten me, maybe his presence there had been innocent after all. All I knew was that the spot was far too beautiful and secluded to give up without a more tangible threat to my safety. I went out for another leisurely country drive that eventually took me back to the cemetery, and as soon as I pulled into the entrance, there he was again. Or, possibly, there he was still, since he was standing over the exact same grave with his back to me. Part of me wanted to back up and get the hell out of there, but at that point, I honestly was more curious than scared. If he had intended to do me harm, he could have done it the first time we were in the cemetery together. And it didn't really make any sense that he would be lurking out in the open to ambush me days later on the off chance that I would come back. So, what the hell was he doing then? And how did he get here? I didn't see any other vehicles around, though that had escaped my attention during our first encounter. Now that I wasn't cornered, he didn't look nearly as threatening as he had before. Instead, he seemed a forlorn, almost tragic figure standing over that grave. My curiosity was piqued, and I was resolved not to give up the cemetery, so I decided to speak with him. Shooting off a text to an acquaintance as a minimal precaution, which didn't send immediately thanks to the poor reception, and palming my mace, I stepped out of my vehicle and approached him. As I got closer, I became more confident, as I could see that his coat added a lot of bulk to him, and that he was actually a rather frail man. He had sharp cheekbones over sunken cheeks and under darkly circled eyes. He was pale, but his skin also had an odd, almost silvery luster to it if that makes sense. His hair was white, too white for someone who looked 50 at the oldest, but oddest of all were his eyes. They were this incredibly vibrant shade of green that stood out like two barrel gemstones in his silvery white face. It would be a shame to have to make such beautiful eyes, I thought. Not that that would stop me. Uh, excuse me, sir, I squeaked out when I was a few feet away from him. He raised his head and turned it towards me, his face sternly melancholic but otherwise friendly enough. I apologize if I'm intruding, but I saw you by this grave a few days ago. It's just, it's got me wondering since all the graves in this place seem far too ancient for any living person to have ever known the people buried in them, so I was just curious as to what you were doing here. The man nodded understandingly seemingly aware of the oddness of what he was doing. The person buried here is an ancestor of mine. Never knew them personally, but their deeds have been felt throughout my family for generations, and it's been our tradition to honor them for that, he said in a hoarse voice. I'm the last of my bloodline now, so the honor falls to me alone. I turned my gaze to the moss-covered grave, scrutinizing it as best as I could but failed to discern any identifying features other than the outline of a cross. There was a single purple rose placed upon the ground, and several silver dollars placed along the base of the gravestone. What about you, miss? He asked. What brings you to this place? Oh, I, uh, I just like cemeteries, I admitted sheepishly. They're pretty and quiet. The man nodded with a slight smirk. Um... How did you get here? I asked. Did someone drop you off or do you live nearby? The latter, very much so, he admitted, pointing towards an enormous evergreen tree. Beneath its sagging branches was a tent, along with some plastic totes and canvas bags. Oh, you're squatting here? I asked as sympathetically as I could. I was secretly relieved since the situation was starting to make at least a little sense. A secluded place like this was a perfect place to squat, and his homelessness explained his emaciated frame, his poorly fitted coat, even his prematurely white hair. But we're miles from the nearest store. You don't walk all the way there and then haul supplies all the way back, do you? I have enough to last me till the end of the month, he replied. After that, 
It won't matter. I mulled over asking what he meant by that, but decided better of it. I was unsure of his mental state, especially since I could see no evidence that this rather humble grave belonged to some venerated ancestor. I deemed it best just to let him believe whatever he wanted. I slipped the mace bag into my pocket and pulled out my coin purse. May I? I asked, gesturing to the row of coins he had laid along the base of the gravestone. He nodded appreciatively, and I left a token payment to his ancestor, or him, for using their graveyard. Is it alright with you if I keep visiting? I really do like it here. It's not my cemetery, miss. Do as you please. He nodded. Thank you. I smiled. I headed back to my car for my coffee, when I paused, tempted to ask him his name. I couldn't do that though without offering mine in exchange. And, as harmless as he now seemed, I still thought it best not to give him any compromising information about myself. I visited the cemetery often for the rest of October, the foliage growing more vibrant and beautiful as the month progressed. I bought some pumpkins from a roadside stand and spent an afternoon carving them into jack-o'-lanterns and scattered them across the grounds. I befriended the semi-feral barn cats that came there to hunt. I played in the piles of leaves like a little girl, pressed my favorite ones into a scrapbook, and just generally did whatever the hell I felt like. One day I examined each grave one by one, noting down anything I found interesting. Angels and crosses could still be made out on some of the headstones, but the only legible words were generic phrases like gone too soon, beloved wife, husband, etc. And, of course, may she, he, or they rest in peace. Not one gravestone still had a date or a name left on it. It struck me as strange, of course, but I honestly had no idea of what to make of it. Each time I entered the cemetery, I'd leave a few more coins by the ancestor's grave as an offering. Sometimes the man would be standing there, but sometimes he'd be in or around his tent. Other times he'd be walking around the rest of the graveyard. And on at least one occasion I wasn't sure if he was there at all, though I have no idea where he would have gone. We acknowledged each other politely, but spoke seldom. We were both there because we wanted to be left alone after all. I do realize that me going by myself to a cemetery with a possibly crazy homeless man might sound reckless, but after the first time we spoke, I just never got the impression he was dangerous. There was only one time he took issue with any of my activities, and that was when I tried to gain entry to the mausoleum. I was fiddling with the lock, thinking it was so old I could probably just break it, when I felt his cold hand grab my shoulder from behind. That's a private mausoleum, miss. Not open to the public, he said firmly. Leave it be. Looking back on it, I will say that he probably wasn't justified in putting his hand on me when the reprimand alone would have sufficed, but at the time I just felt such an intense sensation of being caught doing something I wasn't supposed to that I squeaked out an apology and scurried off to examine the maintenance shed instead. Most interesting thing I found there was one of those old, non-motorized lawnmowers. On my next visit, I brought him a deli sandwich, partially as an apology for my attempt at grave robbing, partially because I brought one for myself and didn't feel right eating it in front of a homeless person, but also in the hopes of getting some information out of him. He accepted it politely, but not exactly gratefully. More like it was a pack of store brand socks from a secret Santa. He didn't seem to care what he ate, or that he was underfed. He was sure he'd make it until the end of the month, and that was enough for him. So, how long have you been here already? I asked between bites of my Reuben sandwich. Since I buried my father, he muttered. Buried him here? I asked in surprise. Wasn't enough left for a proper burial, but this is consecrated ground, so it was good enough, he said with a distant nod. I'm sure you did the best you could, I assured him. His vague, cryptic answers did make me a little uneasy, but I had developed a sense of camaraderie with my fellow graveyard enthusiast and decided to give him the benefit of the doubt, at least for the moment. So, how much do you know about this place? I haven't been able to find out anything about it. How old is it? Does it have a name? Why don't any of the tombstones have names or dates left? The man just shook his head. Oh, lost to time. Most of us are forgotten in less than a hundred years after we pass. No sense in the stones keeping names when those names won't mean anything to anyone, he claimed. I just nodded and finished my sandwich. 
I didn't necessarily disagree with the sentiment, but it hardly explained the condition of the gravestones. I briefly entertained the thought that maybe he had chipped off all the dates and names, but quickly dismissed the notion. None of the gravestones appeared vandalized, just old. I eventually settled on the theory that the headstones had been mass-produced with the generic phrases pre-engraved and any personal information being only cheaply and shallowly carved, explaining why it had all eroded away. It wasn't a perfect theory, but it was the best I could think of. During the last week of October, there was a heavy rainstorm. When it started to lighten, I tossed all my coat and drove out to the cemetery, eager for the smell of wet leaves on the cool, damp air in my beloved sanctuary. When I arrived, I saw that the grave where I had been leaving my offerings had been dug up. Baffled, I ran from my car to the open gate without even shutting the door behind me. To my horror, I beheld the man, muddied and barely conscious, lying at the bottom of the freshly dug four-foot hole. He had evidently decided to take advantage of the rain-softened earth to exhume the grave. But in his fragile, half-starved state, the excursion and the chill of the rain had been too much for him. Without hesitation, I jumped into the grave, grabbed him from under the armpits, and hoisted him up. What the hell were you thinking? I demanded as I slung his body up onto the ground. I... I had to know for sure, he mumbled. That was the only lucid sentence I got out of him for a while. I dragged him back to his tent, cleaned him up, put him in a blanket, and got some water into him. As he recuperated, I started thinking about what exactly my obligations were. I had known that he probably wasn't mentally well, but I'd also thought he was harmless. Just a creepy loner who liked hanging out in graveyards like me. But clearly whatever delusions he hung to had caused him to nearly kill himself. If I didn't at least try to get him help and he died, was I at fault for that? If I didn't get him help, then who would? But would his delusions even let him leave the cemetery peacefully? The thought of him being dragged out of here by cops to be locked up in some asylum was soul-crushing. There was also the more selfish concern about what would happen to the cemetery if I brought it to the attention of government officials. I had fallen so in love with it, I had seriously started considering buying a camper and squatting here myself. Thank you. I was roused from my contemplation by the shameful and apologetic murmur from my tent mate. You're lucky I came here when I did, dummy, I said, giving him a punitive slap across the knee. Otherwise, you'd be just another nameless corpse right now. What were you trying to do? Do you even know? It doesn't matter. He shook his head. I groaned and shoved a cup of dollar store instant ramen into his hand. Look, I can't stay here all night. Are you going to be okay by yourself? I asked. Yes, miss. I'll be fine. Thank you. He nodded. Promise me you won't do any more digging, or anything else that might make you keel over, I demanded. I promise, miss, he swore. I sighed and accepted that that would have to do. I do have one small favor to ask, miss. And what's that? I asked as I put my raincoat back on. Halloween's my last night here, he said. If it's not too much trouble, would you mind seeing me off? Now, I of course wanted to know where the hell he thought he was going, but given his mental state, I figured it wouldn't actually do any good to ask. If Halloween was some sort of locus for his delusions, then it was probably best for him not to be alone. Well, it's not like I had any other plans, I acquiesced. Sure, I'll be here at dark. I'll bring drinks and stuff. We'll have a little Halloween party. I always meant to go to one of those. Halloween night came. I set out a bowl of fun-sized candy bars with a please take two note posted to it and drove off to the cemetery. I'd brought chips, dip, whiskey, and ginger ale coolers. A sandwich platter, Halloween candy, my Bluetooth speaker, and a downloaded Halloween playlist that mostly had covers of This Is Halloween, Monster Mash, and Spooky Scary Skeletons. Maybe not the wildest evening, but it was literally the first party I'd ever thrown, so cut me some slack. When I pulled into the cemetery, I saw that he had placed a trash can in the center and started a bonfire, and surrounded it with my jack-o'-lanterns. I was a little concerned about the safety of this, and that it might attract attention, but it did look amazing, and the night was cold enough that the warmth of the blaze would make the party much more enjoyable. This looks awesome! I cried as I got out of my car and donned my kitty mask, putting out the spread on my car's hood. All I did was put some leaves in a trash can and light a match. You're the one who took the time to carve the pumpkins, he said humbly, pursed into a headstone and staring into the fire. 
Yeah, I'm a real Michelangelo with gourds, I said sarcastically, handing him a fox mask. This time you're not leaving me hanging. Tonight you're going to eat the food I brought and you're going to enjoy it. You're my only guest and I will not have you spoiling the evening for everyone else. Yes, ma'am, he chuckled, helping himself to the sandwich platter. I pulled out my phone, hit play on my music app, and started dancing to Jonathan Young's cover of the Ghostbusters theme song. Normally, I'm pretty self-conscious at social gatherings, to the point that I avoid them as much as I can without being rude. But since the only other person there was even more reserved than I was, I was able to cut loose a bit. I danced around the fire, I sang, I drank, I feasted and just generally made merry. It was the most fun I'd ever had at a party. A couple of hours in and I was taking a breather, leaning up against my car and monologuing to the man about nothing in particular, when a strong gust of wind picked up and blew out the fire in the trash bin. I was taken aback, especially since all the jack-o'-lanterns stayed lit. The cold set in immediately. It was so cold that I could see my breath and frost forming on the ground. In the sparse candlelight, I could see that the man was roused from his normal melancholy. He craned his neck forward, and as I followed his gaze, I saw pale blue flames appear one at a time, hovering in midair over each grave. Miss, stay inside the ring of jack-o'-lanterns and you'll be safe, he said as he quite deliberately stepped outside the ring. They don't want you anyway. Your offerings have been more than sufficient. I'm the one who owes them a debt. Wait, what are you doing? I whispered. I told you, tonight is my last night here, he answered. The wind picked up again, howling like a wild dog, and yet the seemingly weightless apparitions remained exactly where they were. What are those things? I asked, spinning around frantically at the surreal siege of fool's fire. Willow wisps, he said solemnly. Spirits who've had been dead so long, they no longer remember their human lives, and thus cannot summon human form. They appear here every All Hallows Eve when the veil between the outer world and ours is weakest. You've seen these things before? I asked, bewildered at both the supernatural spectacle and his mundane reaction to it. So, they're not dangerous? No, they are. But the jack-o'-lanterns are effective wards against them, he assured me. The wisps started to move now, very gently and heedless of the wind, slowly bobbing towards me and the man. Well, then get in here then. What are you doing? He hung his head and let out a long sigh of resignation. I broke my promise to you, he confessed. I finished digging up my ancestor, though I paced myself a little more this time. It was exactly what I was told it was, an immaculate corpse, incorruptible, perfectly preserved after lying in the earth for centuries. But despite its perfect condition, I can't tell you a damn thing about it. Not even if it was a man or a woman. That was part of the deal they made with the Elder Things so long ago. They traded their identity to ensure the prosperity of our family. Burying their corpses here made the cemetery hollowed to the Elder Things. It's why there are no names on the graves anymore. The Wisps stole them. Desperate for any semblance of humanity. It's why this place is so hard for most people to perceive, let alone remember. Listen to me, you're not thinking clearly. Those things are just oxidizing gases from the graves. I choked out, not believing it myself. Let's just get in my car and leave. And you'll see, we'll be fine. Do not leave that ring until they're gone, he ordered. The wisp slowly but steadily drawing nearer. I have to do this. Part of my ancestors deal with the other things was that each of their direct descendants would sacrifice themselves as well eventually. And every one of us who broke that pact brought ever-increasing misfortune upon us. Until there was just me. I... Thank you. I thought this place would be forgotten after I was gone. I don't know why you can see and remember it. But so long as you do, the wisps won't be able to steal its identity completely. So long as you remember me, they won't be able to steal mine. And you did make my last month just a little more pleasant. Thank you. The wisps were all around him now, spinning in a languid vortex, nipping at him gently as if testing his mettle. His breath hung thick in the air, frost began condensing on his skin and clothes, and he shivered like it was 50 degrees below zero. He reached into his pocket and pulled out a keyring. The cemetery may not be mine, 
But the mausoleum is, he said, throwing the keys into the ring of jack-o'-lanterns. It's yours now, and everything inside it. Before I could ask anything more, the wisps engulfed him en masse. He was smothered in the cold blue flames, but he didn't burn. Instead, each wisp seemed to take a bite out of him, each piece turning into a dark fluid vapor within their flames, greedily devouring him without even leaving a skeleton behind. I, shamefully, was not a hero that night. I screamed and I cried at the sight of him being eaten alive, weeping and cowering as the wisp circled my protective ring. All I could do was pray that the jack-o'-lanterns wouldn't burn out. Since that night, I've often wondered if I should be mad at him for inviting me to watch him die like that. If he had told me ahead of time, I never would have believed him and would have insisted on being there anyway to make sure he didn't harm himself. Even afterwards, I wouldn't have believed it if I hadn't witnessed it myself. I never would have known what happened to him otherwise. And I am glad that he didn't have to die alone. So, I think it's better this way. It's hard to stay mad at the dead anyway. Once I knew exactly how special the cemetery really was, I followed through on my plans to live here. I gave my landlord my one month's notice, bought a camper and some solar panels and set myself up near the woods in the back. I placed a proper front near the entrance where I threw my spare change, in the hopes of placating any elder things that might be watching. I brought a couple of people out there, just to test what the man told me. And all they can remember about it is that I have some trailer out in the middle of nowhere that they can never find without me. They can't even remember it's a cemetery. I spend most of my free time here now. Despite what happened, and what this place is, I still love it. And I decided that it was best not to take what I found in the mausoleum out of the cemetery. It was filled with tomes, grimoires, honest to god spell books full of occult knowledge, presumably accumulated by the man's ancestor. I have been studying them too. I become something of a heads witch you could say. And I know exactly what my first grand working is going to be. I don't think it's fair that the man had to give himself to the wisps because of a deal his ancestors made. I don't believe in the sins of the father or anything like that. I know I didn't know him that long, or that well. I still don't even know his name. But by my standards at least, what we shared was fairly intimate. He was my friend, and I want to do more than just remember him. I plan to take his spirit back from the wisps and make him my familiar. That's why for Halloween 2019, I'll be throwing another party, this time one wicked enough to wake the dead. So after I told you all about this strange experience I had in my little cemetery, a few of you wanted to know how my Halloween party went. Better than the last one, thank you very much. Don't worry, I'm joking. I am going to tell you what happened, but before I do, I need to tell you more about my year in between the last two Halloweens. Otherwise, it just wouldn't make any sense. Hopefully you'll find it as interesting as I did, and I'll spread it across a few chapters and make it easier to digest. But I promise you this story does have a resolution and we will get to it. As you already know, the night the man died I was stuck inside a ring of jack-o'-lanterns, surrounded by formless spirits he called wisps. They couldn't pass over the circle he'd made, but they seemed to be aware of my presence. After they had devoured the man, they started orbiting around me, forming a pillar of cold blue flames that spiraled up into the night sky until I couldn't tell them apart from the stars. If I hadn't just watched them kill my friend, it would have been beautiful. Nothing caught in their ghostly light made a shadow, and yet there were shadows. Shadows of things that weren't there. Things that didn't or couldn't exist in the natural world. Even though I was hysterical, I was cognizant enough to think that the shadows were of things on the other side of the veil, where the man said the wisps were from, and that the wisps were still not fully in our world and so their light was obstructed from the other side. At the time, I didn't know if the shadows were just horrifically distorted, or if they were accurate representations of horrifically distorted creatures. Since there was nothing I could do to fend them off anyway, I just closed my eyes and tried to wait for it to be over. That's when I realized that, mixed in with the howling of the wind, was an uncanny choir of ethereal voices. It was faint, and if there were any words, they weren't English. But I could tell that they weren't coming from the wisps, but from across the veil. I almost had a heart attack then, fighting my body's nearly overwhelming fight or flight response, knowing that staying put was my only chance for survival. As I listened to the voices, I came to realize that they weren't directed at me. 
If the things on the other side of the veil knew I was there, they didn't care. Their music was in celebration, a Halloween celebration that dwarfed mine by a thousand orders of magnitude. A vague sort of image started to form in my mind, of a grand festival dedicated to the most scared night of the year. In my horror, I wondered what could possibly give these ghastly beings cause for such jubilation. To my dismay, something on their side chose to answer me, in a nigh and audible whisper that my panicked mind just barely managed to parse meaning from. Oh, Hallow's Eve marks the return of our queen, Persephone. Around midnight, the wisps and voices disappeared and the world seemed normal again, if hopelessly dark and silent. With nothing now to light my way but the candles of the jack-o'-lanterns, I dashed to my car and sped out of the cemetery, letting all the party supplies I had placed on the hood fly off where they would. It was pitch black that night, and I was in no state to be driving, let alone as fast as I was, but I somehow made it home in one piece. I locked myself in my apartment, took a lorazepam, and without getting undressed, I crawled into bed with my cat and cried myself to sleep. I took more of my lorazepam than I should have over the next week, but I had no idea how else to cope with my experience. Not only had I watched someone's violent death and been put in mortal danger myself, but I had also come into contact with some kind of spirit world, possibly the underworld of Greek mythology. I honestly think the only reason I didn't have any suicide ideation was because that would have just taken me straight to what I was running from. It had been psychologically and existentially traumatic, and I didn't think I could tell anyone about it. No one would believe me, and if someone started snooping around the graveyard, I might be implicated in the man's death. And on top of that, I also mourned the loss of the cemetery. I loved that cemetery. It was perfect, but I told myself that it was dangerous and that I could never go back. But almost immediately, a contradictory thought emerged that just grew louder and louder and would not be silenced. It was magic. I had to go back. And so... I did. I thought it was stupid. I thought it was crazy. I thought it was infinitely stupider and crazier than when I had been going there when there was a potentially crazy homeless squatter. But God damn it, I love that cemetery. It was a week or so after Halloween. I left at dawn so that I would have as much daylight as possible. Though at the time I wasn't even sure of what exactly I meant to do. I parked outside the cemetery instead of inside like I usually do because that somehow made it easier for me. I stood right in front of the gates for nearly 10 minutes, I think, just trying to muster up the courage to walk back in. I stared inwards longingly, thinking about how beautiful it was in the morning light, those titanic trees swaying and creaking softly in the wind. The man had said that the wisps only came on Halloween, when the veil was weakest, and I had no reason not to believe him. I had been in there over half a dozen times before that night, and he had been living there for at least a month. Eventually, my yearning and rationalizations overpowered my fear, and I stepped through the arch. The second I did so, I was acutely aware of a sense of sanctity and serenity, of being not quite of this world. All cemeteries had that to some extent, but this one had it in abundance, and I had never consciously realized that before. Though, I think I must have picked up on it at some level. I also picked up on what I then realized was the veil the barrier between our world and others. It was noticeably weaker in the cemetery, and walking into it as deliberately as I had made that undeniably apparent. Once I knew what I was feeling, I was immediately assured that the veil was much stronger than it had been on Halloween. The cemetery, my cemetery, was safe. Tears of relief flowed down my cheeks. Laughing, I dropped to the ground and made a snow angel in the leaves near delirious with joy at my return to my sepulchral sanctum. I know, I'm weird. Once my mood had stabilized a bit, I took note of the mess I had left and went to work cleaning it up. The sandwiches and open chips had been plundered by crows, but there were numerous candy bars and cooler cans still scattered about. I also found my Bluetooth speaker, which had survived its week exposed to the elements surprisingly well. And then, the key ring. The keys to the mausoleum that the man had thrown to me as his final action and gifted to me with his dying breath. I was suddenly ashamed to have left them behind, to have forgotten them, to have just stumbled upon them instead of searching them out on purpose. I suppose I was lucky the crows hadn't stolen them as well. I slowly bent down and gingerly picked them up. 
The only time the man had even shown me any hostility was when I tried to force my way into the mausoleum, and he had ultimately decided to bequeath it to me than to let it be forgotten. What was in there that had mattered so much to him? I approached the mausoleum, appraising it in as much detail as I could. It was solid marble except for a copper grate window near the top on either side, slightly too high for me to see into. I thought about maybe trying to find something to stand on, just to get an idea of what was in there before opening it, but realized the small holes and limited light likely wouldn't offer much of a view. I decided it was best just to open the door and see what was inside. Above the doorway, there was the worn down carving of a king and queen of some kind, but other than that, it was barren of embellishment. I unlocked and opened the iron gate first, fully revealing the copper plated door on the other side. It was green as the Statue of Liberty, but still lacked any identifying features or adornments. I placed my ear up against it, listening for any signs of activity from within. I knocked and listened, and still there was nothing. Hello? I shouted. Is there anyone in there? It's not that I didn't trust the man, but I couldn't shake the foreboding feeling that by opening the mausoleum, I would be unleashing some sort of horrible ancient evil. I didn't hear anything inside move though, so I decided it was safe to progress. I placed the key into the door, turned it, and then slowly pulled the door back, ready to slam it shut again if need be. As the sunlight illuminated the inside of the mausoleum, I was relieved to find it devoid of any inhabitants, spirit or otherwise. My attention was instead stolen by a large portrait hung on the far wall. It depicted a cavernous subterranean realm of glittering limestone, misty rivers, and brilliant blue auroras. There were some of the wisps I had seen on Halloween, but also more humanoid forms made of the same glowing substance, shambling along the crystalline ground. In the foreground were a king and queen on ebony thrones, pale-skinned, dark-robed, and white-haired, with glowing blue irises the same shade as the wisps. The three-headed dog resting at their feet left no doubt that they were intended to be Hades and Persephone. Persephone noticeably held an open pomegranate in her right hand, and with her left, she glibly placed a seed into her smugly smiling lips. I took that as an indication that in this depiction, Persephone was the consensual queen of the underworld. I inspected and admired the painting for a few minutes, but my knowledge of fine art is limited, so I couldn't estimate how old it was. It looked like it would bring in some decent money at auction though, and, as beautiful as it was, I briefly wondered why the man had never sold it. I decided then to search through the rest of the mausoleum for answers. There was a sealed tomb in the center with no way for me to find out who or what was inside, short of taking a sledgehammer to it. It had a purple velvet runner draped over it, with a padded wooden chair to its side, like someone had been using it as a table. There were a dozen other casket niches built into the east and west walls, two wide by three high, but all they held were candles. I knew that some mausoleums only held bodies during the winter so that they could be buried when the ground thawed, but if that's what this building was for, then why was there a sealed tomb in the middle? The question that bugged me the most though was if this was the man's family mausoleum, then why had his ancestor been buried outside instead of in here? The last thing of note was a small bookcase beneath the portrait. There were three shelves and a few dozen books, all of which looked at least a couple hundred years old. On top of the bookcase was a heap of much more modern documents bound with an elastic band and a small personal safe. I tried one of the remaining keys on the safe and it worked. Inside was a large stack of cash, jewelry, and commemorative coins, which I half-heartedly noted were now mine. I hadn't come back there to look for money though. I wanted to know more about what I had seen. I took the stack of documents and sat down by the tomb to read them, assuming they would contain the most recent information. I was frustrated at first since none of the documents had any names or dates. The wisps, little identity thieves they were, had already picked them clean. I was, however, able to piece together enough to confirm what the man had told me about his family. They had at one point been old money, but a series of ever-worsening misfortunes over several generations had nearly wiped them and their wealth out. After what looked to be the most recent death, presumably the man's father, he had sold off any assets he had left, paid off his debts, and took what was left back to the cemetery. There was a psychiatrist note mentioning that he had become increasingly paranoid and showed signs of persecutory delusions, that he believed he was being punished by angry spirits for the betrayal of his family. 
He said that he planned to seek sanctuary on hallowed ground, where he would be safe until he had a chance to set things right with them. I knew he wasn't crazy. I had seen the wisps and heard the music of the underworld. I felt truly sorry for him then. For him to have suffered through tragedy and loss his entire life, knowing that he would be next, and that the best he could hope for was to give himself to them on his own terms. I wished that he was at peace, but from what I had seen so far, I had no assurances of that. I thought about how horrible my newfound gnosis was, to know that there was an afterlife, but for that to offer no comfort, and even inspire greater dread than the prospect of oblivion, for the first time in my life to fear hell. Setting the documents aside, I turned to the bookshelf in the hopes that it would be able to offer me some kind of understanding about what I was dealing with. It was then that I noticed that the very first book had a small sticky note attached to its spine. Miss, start here. I guess the man's decision to leave me the mausoleum wasn't as last minute as it seemed. I picked up the book and saw that it was a journal of some kind. I opened it and inserted at the front was a loose leaf table of contents, written in the same hand as the sticky note. Starting with the man's recommendations, I soon realized that the journal had been written by the same ancestor who had made a deal with the elder things in the first place. They described themselves as having been born with a second sight, or clairvoyance which, among other things, made them aware of spirits. They used this clairvoyance to bootstrap themselves to considerable wealth and social standing, which they then used to seek other gifted individuals and sources of occult knowledge, which is where their collection of arcane literature had come from. They developed what modern scientists and philosophers would call a panpsychic theory of consciousness. That consciousness was a fundamental constituent of reality like mass or charge. And just like those constants, consciousness did have a direct effect on reality, however minuscule. They came to the conclusion that psychic abilities were the result of being able to focus, amplify, and control these effects. For example, the particles in anything that's not absolute zero are moving. It's just that their movement is random, and on the whole, they cancel each other. Telekinesis would be collapsing the wave function of an object so that all the particles move in the same direction all at once. But that's my take on it. They obviously didn't know anything about quantum physics. They also believe that consciousness became more complex within the bodies of living things, especially the nervous system of intelligent animals. At some threshold, the organization created by these beings becomes self-sustaining and an individual's consciousness survives the death of its original substrate. They were certain of this not only because they had seen spirits, but because they had eventually developed astral projection, the ability to leave their own body. This led them to discover that there were in fact other planes of existence besides our own, and that consciousness was not bound to any one of them. It was during these out-of-body experiences that they discovered a race of beings they called the Elder Kin which they thought other peoples had viewed as fey or gods. I think it's interesting to note that the man had referred to them as elder things. It's possible he just liked Lovecraft, but I'm guessing it's because his experience with them had left him reluctant to think of them as kin. The ancestor, not content with her already considerable gifts and wealth, wanted to know what the elder kin could do for them. I'm going to quote the journal directly here. I have learned that if seeking a boon from the rulers of Underworld, it is best to do so between the dates of Subhane and Beltane, when the queen is at court. Just as the Greek myths have said, the maiden spends half the year in the summerland with the Earth Mother. When Hades rules alone, he is not inclined towards generosity. Unlike his lecherous brothers, what warmth there is in Hades' heart is for his queen alone. And when she is with her mother, he becomes cold and stern allowing himself to feel nothing, lest he feel the pain of her absence. I have also learned not to pity Persephone. The shades of the underworld tell a different story than the one I have read. They say that wearying of her eternal maidenhood, and with ambitions that could never be realized in her mother's shadow, it was Persephone that seduced Hades. Whereas Hades rules only because he drew the short straw with his brothers, Persephone believes it is better to rule in hell than to serve in heaven, and relishes her position as the queen of the underworld. It is to her, then, that I must make my case. If I can appeal to her sense of regal magnanimity, she may grant it, and Hades will defer to her judgment. After that, it reads like a fairly typical Faustian bargain, with a man's ancestor selling their eternal soul for Earth's prosperity. 
the only difference being that Persephone demanded their entire bloodline as the price. Since the ancestor was asking their gifts pass on without fail to their descendants, I was angry when I read that they accepted this bargain, that they sold not only their own soul but that of every child, grandchild, and great-grandchild they would spawn. Because of their myopic selfishness, my friend wasn't only dead but condemned to what sounded like an abysmal afterlife for all eternity. I felt so helpless then, that there was nothing that I as a mere mortal could do to challenge the will of ancient gods. But then, I had a sudden epiphany. I was clairvoyant. Maybe I had always been and just never realized it. Maybe my time in the cemetery or my exposure to the wisp had changed me. I didn't know, and it didn't matter. All that mattered was that I could sense the veil in spirits, just like the man's ancestor could. I glanced over at the bookshelf and realized that all the knowledge the ancestor had used to hone their skills and grow their power was right in front of me. By then it was around 5 o'clock. The sun was getting low and I realized I hadn't consumed anything other than a bottle of water for about 10 hours. I set everything back as I found it, locked up the mausoleum, and headed back to my car. I told myself I needed food and sleep and time to process all that I had learned before committing to anything. But I knew my heart was already set. Just the day before I wasn't sure if I would ever visit my cemetery again. And now I was determined to follow through on my plan to move out there permanently, to be closer to the spirits and my hoard of arcane knowledge. I was going to become a witch and maybe, just maybe, become powerful enough to write something that had gone so terribly wrong. As you've probably noticed by now, I'm typically a fairly anxious person, and moving out to an abandoned, haunted cemetery and living off the grid miles from town was not a decision that I made lightly. I worried about everything that could possibly go wrong, and probably quite a few things that couldn't actually go wrong. But no matter how much I tried to talk myself out of it, I could not break my own resolve. I couldn't leave the cemetery and its secrets to rot. No matter the challenges or risks, I would make it my own. I wasn't foolhardy about it either though. I did a lot of research and preparation for it, and before I was willing to fully commit to buying a camper trailer, I decided I needed to spend at least one full night in the cemetery to make sure I wouldn't be in any danger from the spirits that dwelt just on the other side of the weakened veil. Otherworldly things do tend to be more active at night, when the veil is a little weaker and mortals tend to be either sleepy or fearful. The man had been squatting there for at least several weeks, but I was unsure what precautions, if any, he had taken to ensure his safety. The cemetery itself sits in the middle of a municipal forest called Harrowick Woods, a little under 10 miles past the city limits. It's around a mile wide by 4 miles long, with a country lane named Harrowick Mile Road slicing through the center. The cemetery is a 5 acre plot of land in the middle, just to the north of the lane. With the exception of the entry arch, the graveyard itself is almost entirely obscured by the tree line, and the path leading into it is easy to overlook. Harrowick Mile isn't that heavily used either, so even if it wasn't hexed, the cemetery is pretty inconspicuous. Since I couldn't find anything about a cemetery in Harrowick Woods online, I combed through records at the public library in Town Hall and still came up empty. Ever since the man's ancestor made it hollowed ground, information about the cemetery and anything in it just fade from mortal memory. If I stayed long enough, I'd probably be forgotten too. I am at least pretty sure that the existence of the cemetery is perfectly natural, since it makes sense that back in the days before motor vehicles, the local farming community would have wanted a closer graveyard than the one in town. My research wasn't entirely fruitless, however, since the Harrowick Woods has long held a reputation of being haunted. Over the past two centuries, there's been at least dozens of sightings and encounters of spirits and fairies, a legend about a horned green man that still protects the woods from development, a handful of other minor cryptids, and even one account of the Harrowick Mile becoming an infinite loop during certain times, just to name a few. Aside from the Will of the Wisps, I had yet to experience any of these things during my time in the cemetery. While there wasn't a lot of consistency between the various alleged encounters and folklore, I did manage to find multiple incidents of hikers wandering off the trails and experiencing missing time, which is exactly what would happen if a non-clairvoyant found the cemetery and there was no one else there. They'd just forget about it. 
Other than that, I was thoroughly unimpressed by the hodgepodge of urban legends and campfire stories that seemingly had nothing to do with the Elder Kin, Wisps, or the Hadean Underworld. At first, I thought I could dismiss them as apocryphal, but then it occurred to me that maybe creatures weirder than myself might be attracted to a hollowed cemetery as well. As unnerving as that thought was, I couldn't find a single confirmed instance of someone dying in the woods, and there weren't supposed to be any large predators living in it either. There was even a small campground at the north end of the forest, which I remembered I had actually been to a few times as a teenager, so I decided it would be safe enough to spend the night. The cemetery was beautiful as always when I arrived, though not as vibrant as it had been in October. Now the trees were all but bare, the leaves upon the ground had grown dull, and the atmosphere was overall more somber and subdued. There weren't many people aside from myself who'd considered naked trees and crumbling gravestones under a dark grey sky a cordial sight, but I'll take it over a crowded urban center in a heartbeat. I was also glad to see that the man's tent was still standing under the evergreen tree. I had never taken it down, and though I had only been in it once before I deemed it suitable enough to spend at least one night in, though I brought my own sleeping bag for hygienic reasons, I had arrived long before sunset and set to work sorting through the man's possessions what little there was, as respectfully as I could. Anything fit for donation, I would drop off at goodwill. But I was somewhat taken aback to find that there wasn't a single item of food left. He really had only brought himself just enough to make it to Halloween. Aside from a meager allotment of clothes, blankets, hygiene supplies, and water testing strips, which I presumed he used for the hand pump well at the back of the cemetery, the only notable personal effect I came across was a russet brown leather wallet with a Mandela embossed on the front. I opened it up and found no cash or cards, only a single pocket-sized photograph framed in the plastic window slot. In it I saw the man standing with a slightly younger woman, holding what looked like a two-year-old girl upon her knee. I could only assume they were his wife and daughter, and that the outer kin had likely caused their deaths just to torment him. After finding that, I had to take a moment and study myself before I could continue. Once I bagged up all the man's old belongings and tossed them into the trunk of my car, I hauled out the fountain I had brought to serve as a kind of donation font for the Elder Kin. The Ancestor's Journal had made it very clear that the Elder Kin must be shown respect and deference at all times to avoid offending them. Though I didn't realize it at the time, leaving spare change on the ancestor's grave had been a token sacrifice that expressed my gratitude for them letting me use the cemetery. I figured that if I wanted to live there full time, I would need to show them a little bit more respect, and the fountain was a kind of down payment on that. I spent a few hundred dollars on it, which I hoped would be a sufficient investment to ensure my well-being. It was fiberglass with a pewter finish, solar powered with a large basin upon a three-sided base. Each side had a relief depicting either the Maiden, Mother, or Crone. Though I wasn't yet a practicing Wiccan, the Ancestor's Journal had alluded to Persephone being an avatar of the Maiden Goddess, so I thought the motif was appropriate. And if the spirits didn't like it, it would at least make a nice bird bath. Once it was filled up and running, I reverently gathered up all the coins along the grave and plunked them in, along with the spare change I had with me. I didn't know yet what I would do once it was filled up with coins, but that was a while away. While I was doing this, I noted that the purple rose I had first seen resting on the ancestor's grave all those weeks ago was still there, and didn't appear to have wilted at all. Curiously, I picked it up to see if maybe it was plastic or some other artifice. A gentle prodding of its thorns seemed to indicate it was genuine, as did its still vibrant fragrance, as strong as if it had been freshly picked. Each time I had seen it before Halloween, I had just assumed it was a fresh wild rose that the man picked from somewhere nearby, as weird as that was. He'd been dead for weeks at that point, so it obviously hadn't been replaced in at least that long. An undying rose in a graveyard, I smirked to myself. I brushed it off as having something to do with the ancestor and their magic, and maybe during my studies of their library I'd learn more about it. I dug a small hole with my finger into the earth, still soft from when the man had exhumed the grave and placed the stem so that it stood erect inside it. It still had leaves, and even an ordinary cut flower that still has leaves can be replanted. Since his rose was magic, I was fairly optimistic about its prospects. Once I'd finished setting myself up to spend the night, I went about my secondary purpose for visiting the cemetery, having a small memorial for the man who had been there before me. As far as I knew, I was the only living person who both knew and cared about his death. 
so it was the least I could do. I leaned a memorial wreath up against the ancestor's grave, placing the photograph I had found in the man's wallet inside of it. I fetched three of the silver coins from the safe in the mausoleum and, lacking a body, placed them on the wreath as well in the hopes they could still be used to pay the ferryman. As the sun went down, I lit a small candle inside of a porcelain jack-o'-lantern holder and, kneeling by the grave with it in my hands, deliberated on what to say. I, uh, I don't know if you can hear me where you are. I still don't know how a lot of this works. It's all pretty terrifying to be honest. And while I'm being honest, part of me is mad at you and thinks you ruined my life, but even that part of me doesn't think you deserve to burn in hell forever. The time you've been down there already is probably more than you ever deserved. Anyway, despite my mixed feelings, I do want to thank you for what you did. Leaving me the keys to the mausoleum, indexing your ancestor journal, all of that. Without it, I would have been so confused and lost. But now I at least have an inkling of what happened, and I have the chance to understand more. Even if the truth is terrible, I still think it's better to know the truth than to live in ignorance. So, no matter what ultimately happens with me or my sanity, thank you for sharing your knowledge with me. God, I wish I knew your name. I wish I had told you mine. I'm sorry I never properly introduced myself. When we first met, it was a justifiable precaution, but after that, crazy homeless guy or not, you were my friend. I'd like to say better late than never, but I have no idea if that's true either. But in case it is, my name is Samantha, Samantha Sumner. So if you can hear me, I've decided to appoint myself the caretaker of this cemetery. As you already know, I love it out here. It's so beautiful and peaceful. Other than that one time, of course, it's sacred to the Elder Kin, a weak point in the veil with a store of arcane knowledge, and I can't let that be lost. I'm going to try to live out here, as much as I can anyway, but who knows if that will work out. The monetary assets you left me in the mausoleum, I promise I won't waste them on anything frivolous. It's all going to go to maintaining this place. I'm pretty sure that's what you would have wanted. I don't really want for money anyway. I'm a bit of a poor bourgeoisie's. My parents bought me some mutual funds when I was a baby, which they filled up with savings and inheritance until I turned 18. If I had to, I could survive off those alone. It's the books that I'm really excited about. I'm going to learn everything your ancestor knew about spirits in the other world, hone my own clairvoyance into full-blown witchcraft and, if I'm lucky, if we're both lucky, maybe figure out some way to help you. Maybe that's wishful thinking. You and all your other ancestors had access to those books for generations, and you couldn't figure a way out of the deal with Persephone. I'm not going to lie, right now I have next to no idea what I could possibly do, but I'm still going to try. I think that was all I wanted to say to you. Thanks for everything, and know that I'm still up here to remember you and take care of the cemetery, and I'll be keeping an eye out for anything that might make your eternity a little less infernal. Until then, I've left you a few pennies for the ferryman, just in case you actually do have to pay to get into hell. I also have some libations. It's a horse diage cognac my dad likes, and we drink together when he visits. Cheers. I raised the bottle in a toast, took a swig for myself, then poured out the rest upon the ground for my friend. When it was empty, I replaced the lid and propped it up against the grave as well. May these spirits lift your spirits, my friend. Amen. After that, the sun was gone, and it wasn't even 5.30 yet. I had five or six hours to kill in the dark before I could go to sleep. That's probably why people don't go camping in late November too much. I had brought a powerful flashlight with me in case I needed it, but I still didn't want to go slumbing around the cemetery in the dark if I didn't have to. Instead, I got a fire going and set myself up in a canvas folding chair, which I didn't intend to leave until bedtime, bearing biological necessities. I read the book I brought with me. I listened to downloaded music on my phone. I ate my dinner, and quite often I just sat there quietly, listening to the world around me. A winter silence had already set in that was seductively soothing. All cold-blooded creatures had either died off, migrated, or gone into hibernation, leaving just the owls and coyotes as the only singers in the nocturnal choir. I was still a little on edge from Halloween, of course, so I did pay close attention to any signs of spectral happenings. But I saw no wisps or ghosts, heard no ethereal voices, and while the veil was slightly weaker than it was during the day, it was still nowhere near as weak as it had been on Hallow's Eve. As the hours ticked by, I became more and more complacent in my surroundings. 
convinced that there was no otherworldly threat here. Mundane threats seemed vanishingly unlikely as well. I didn't even need to worry about trespassers. I was probably the only person around for miles. And even if it wasn't, the nature of the cemetery itself shielded me from everyone except those wandering in by sheer happenstance. It was ironic. I had been so anxious about spending the night in the cemetery, but in its peace and quiet and seclusion I was probably the least anxious I had ever been. Reveling in the pureness of my solitude, I tilted my head back and looked up at the rural night sky. The clouds had parted some time ago, and with no light pollution, the stars were innumerable and brilliant. I could even make out the Milky Way, which I hadn't seen with my own eyes for many years. Living in the cemetery, I'd be able to see it every clear night. This is going to be great, I smiled, reassured in my decision to make this my new home. My dreams, though, were not familiar. That night, and every night I've slept in my cemetery since, I have had vivid mystic dreams that I often struggle to interpret. I've since come to realize that when I sleep, when my mind is quiet and deprived of earthly stimuli, it is more receptive to spiritual revelations from across the weakened veil. That first night, I dreamed of my cemetery when it was young, in the bright daylight of a bygone summer. The graves were not only pristine, they had names upon them. Though I was unable to recall a single one when I awoke, I then saw a figure standing in the entry arch, their body completely shrouded in an impenetrably black fog, without a single identifying feature left exposed. They stood right in the middle with their arms outstretched and their head craned towards the sky. They began to chant in a language I didn't recognize, and without changing their stance, they slowly marched forward. Behind them followed a procession of astral beings, issuing from the now hexed archway. They were incorporeal, skeletal things made of faint shadow. Their gaunt frames wrapped in thin cloaks of darkness, bobbing along the ground as if gravity were a mere suggestion to them. All of them had bowed heads and bent backs, all carried themselves with a trodden stance and hopeless grimace. All marched forward only because they had long ago lost the will to resist anyone who might seek to dominate them. As the shadow wraith and his dejected slaves advanced through the cemetery, day was turned to night and summer to winter. Life and light and hope forsaking everything in their path. I saw the names on the headstones evaporate into the night, forever lost to the void. When the grim troop finally reached the opposite end of the cemetery, and it was entirely cast in a dismal winter darkness, they stood before a second archway identical to the first. When the shadow wraith stepped foot under it, it seemed the ritual was complete. The slaves, released from their duty, collapsed to the ground to weep and scream and moan as they disintegrated into dust. A ring of bright blue, deathly cold flames encircled the cemetery, forming a perimeter with the two archways as its terminals. Thunder cracked in a palpable darkness deeper than any earthly night enveloped the cemetery, pouting it in a rain of black ichor from some cursed titan. I could feel everything slowly sinking, sinking away from the mortal plane and into the underworld. The shadow wraith moved towards the middle of the cemetery now to inspect its work. The cemetery would evermore be of two worlds, with the front gate for mortals and the back gate for spirits, with both of them now an equal distance from the wraith. The question remained, which world did it desire the most? I awoke then in the early morning, well rested but with a strange and unexpected dream still at the forefront of my mind. Had any of that really happened? Not necessarily literally, but was there any kernel of truth to it at all? There was one way to find out. I leaped out of the tent and raced to the far end of the cemetery, skidding to a stop before I reached the woods. There, just behind the tree line, was a second archway. I hadn't seen it before because the foliage had been too thick but now the naked trees left it plainly exposed. It seemed that the cemetery had originally been a bit longer, and that the tree line had managed to encroach inwards over the centuries. I stood there dumbfounded for a moment. The revelation from my dream clearly manifested in the waking world. I didn't doubt that it was a portal to the underworld. Even in those early days, my clairvoyance was keen enough to sense its ominous astral properties. I took slow, cautious strides towards it, fearful that Kerberos himself would come charging to keep me out. The archway looks so mundane, exactly like the one out front, but its intrinsic cathodic nature was bearing down on my soul like a freight train. The closer I got, the more I had to fight my instinct to recoil. When I was right in front of it, I tentatively raised my arm. Abandon all hope, 
Ye who enter here, I muttered before shoving my arm through the archway. Nothing happened. It was a portal for spirits after all. The dream had been quite clear about that. I could walk under it all I wanted and nothing would happen so long as my soul was firmly bound to my body. If I ever wanted to use it, I'd have to be dead, or, like the man's ancestor had, learn how to astral project. I was a little crestfallen at this new revelation to be honest. I had proven to myself that I could spend the night in the cemetery with no ill effect, though not without effect entirely. I learned more about the nature of the cemetery and discovered a means by which I may aid my hell-bound friend. But the reality of the task was daunting. I ruled that nothing needed to be decided right away, and that I should go to the somber starlight roadhouse up the highway and get a hot breakfast. I didn't have much faith in myself at that moment, even if I could learn to astral project. I doubted if I'd ever have the courage to make an Orphean trek to the underworld by myself. But I wouldn't have to. Just a few months later, I would meet Genevieve, a gifted witch, learned occultist, and the love of my life. The next few months were pretty uneventful for me. I bought my camper trailer, moved into the cemetery, and didn't have a single close encounter with anything paranormal. I read through every book in the mausoleum, jotting down notes in my own book of shadows so that I felt like a proper witch. I journaled my dreams there as well since they were my only glimpse into the astral plane. By late March, I had yet to successfully astral project, and I was starting to get nervous. If I couldn't manage to do it by May Day, then I'd have to wait at least until the next Halloween before I'd have a chance to petition Persephone to release my friend. Another six months of literal hell. As heavily as the thought weighed on my mind, I didn't head downtown that day looking for another witch to help me learn the craft. I just went to get seeds so that I could plant a garden when the weather turned warmer. But while I was driving along Queen Street, a building just down Albion Avenue caught my eye. It was a beautiful Victorian house with the ground floor converted into a storefront. Eve's Eden of Esoterica, Spiritual Wellness and Metaphysical Supply Center. A new age shop that I had seen before but never really gave much thought to. Even after my experience on Halloween, I never considered that commodified mysticism could offer any actual answers to me. And yet, as I gazed upon the building, I couldn't deny that my spidey sense was tingling. My clairvoyance told me that something genuinely paranormal was in that shop. Even if I was wrong, it couldn't hurt to look. I parked on the side of the avenue and walked up to the entrance, where I was greeted with multiple posted flyers advertising the shop's wares and services. They sold crystals, candles, incense, books, tarot decks, Ouija boards, spell kits, altar idols, holistic medicine, herbal teas, and an assortment of related paraphernalia. They frequently hosted yoga and meditation classes, offered personally metaphysical consultations, whatever that meant, and once a month held women-led sacral sexuality seminars. Honestly, the place embodied pretty much every new agey stereotype I could think of, and I almost would have laughed at it if it weren't for the hand-drawn logo on the front door. It was a blonde, biblical Eve, but instead of an apple, her forbidden fruit was a pomegranate. She raised a seed to smugly smiling lips exactly like the portrait of Persephone in the mausoleum. Obviously a feminist reimagining of an old story turned an act of subjugation into one of empowerment was a novel concept, but the specific similarities to the Persephone portrait were uncanny. Whoever had drawn that clearly knew something of the other world, and I needed to speak with them. I pushed open the door, ringing an old fashioned bell as I did so and I immediately saw what it was I had sensed from outside. Sitting at the front desk and reading a book was an absolutely breathtaking young woman. She was tall and lithe with long tresses of ashen blonde hair, intense blue eyes with smoky eyeshadow, feline cheekbones with a delicate nose and chin, her fair skin decorated with colorful nature and pagan tattoos. She looked like the Eve on the front door, just wearing slightly more clothing. She was dressed in a dark green hooded crocheted vest that was only held closed by a drawstring at the chest, leaving her flat stomach and pierced navel proudly on display, along with a pair of khaki shorts. What was even more remarkable than her appearance was her aura. I could sense with ease that she was a powerful clairvoyant like myself, far more so than anyone else I had encountered since I started studying the occult. Someone who might actually be able to provide me with some guidance into this new arcane world I had stumbled into. 
And I, being the socially anxious wallflower that I am, just stood and stared dumbfounded at her, too nervous to even say hello. After a moment of silence, she looked up from her book, greeted me with a retail smile that instantly morphed into an expression of genuine surprise and delight. Hello, sister. She beamed, rising from her desk and extending her right arm. At first, I reflexively recoiled at her attempt at imposed familiarity, but then realized that she could read me as easily as I could read her. If being witches didn't make us kin, then what did? Hello, sister, I murmured, meekly shaking her hand and averting my eyes as much as I could. Even though she was only actually a few inches taller than me, I felt completely dwarfed by her. Ah, you're Eve then, I take it? Genevieve, yes. Genevieve Fawn. Eve or Evie works fine though, she introduced herself. Wow, Genevieve Fawn, that's such a beautifully witchy name, I fawned. I'm, uh, Samantha Sumner, and I do prefer Samantha in full. You got it, she smiled warmly. It's a rare pleasure to meet another gifted woman, especially a lovely redhead like yourself. How is it that we've never crossed paths before? Are you new to Somber Mori? Oh, no, I've lived here all my life, I replied. But I only recently became aware of my clairvoyance. Last Halloween, I had a pretty intense encounter with the supernatural, and since then I've been studying it intently. I'm concerned that I've come as far as I can on my own, though. And I felt your aura from outside. I was hoping you might be able to help me hone my abilities. I'm especially interested in learning how to astral project. I would love to take you on as an initiate, she smiled with sparkling eyes. Do you have some time now, actually? We can go into the parlor and talk over some wine or weed if you like. I have plenty of both. Big yes on the wine. Merlot if you have it. I always need a little social lubricant to open up to new people. I nodded, relieved that I wouldn't have to fight against my social anxiety just to talk to her. I only smoke if you have a CBD dominant strain. Anything more than 15% THC tends to turn my anxiety into full-blown paranoia. I've got some sativa that should work for you, she replied. Please, take a seat. I'll be with you in a moment. I did as she asked, sitting in the parlor while she flipped the open signs on the door to closed and fetched a bottle of Merlot, wine glasses, and an adorable little mini bong with a pentagram on one side and a triple moon goddess sigil on the other. She poured the wine first and I sipped mine as she readied the bong. There. Take a little hit off that and tell me if it's too much for you, she said, passing it to me. I nodded appreciatively as I took a small hit to test it, swirling the smoke in my mouth a bit before inhaling into my lungs, then blowing it back out. That's perfect, thank you, I said, taking a bigger hit before passing it back to her. No problem, she said as she took a hit herself. So, how about you start by telling me about this encounter you had on Halloween? And I did. I get pretty talkative when I have something in me to calm my nerves. So I spent more than an hour telling her everything that I'd been through since October. She sat there listening with rapt interest, rarely interrupting. I let out an exhausted sigh when I finally finished and went to drain the rest of my wine. Wow, she murmured. You really had to watch him die? Yeah, it was probably the worst thing that's ever happened to me, I admitted. And when I say that, it sounds like I must be pretty damn stupid to be living there now. I don't think you're stupid, Samantha. I think you're incredibly resilient to have not let one traumatic experience ruin a place that clearly means a lot to you, she countered earnestly. I mean, I love this house, but if something like that happened here, I don't know if I'd be strong enough to stay. You're a remarkable woman, Samantha. I nodded half-heartedly, utterly unconvinced of that. Um, the, uh, the picture on your front door of Eve, it looks almost exactly like the portrait of Persephone in my mausoleum. I finally managed to bring up. When I saw that, I thought that it couldn't be a coincidence. You've spoken with spirits yourself, haven't you? I have, including ones that have claimed to have visited both the underworld and Summerland, she nodded. I also have visions, on occasion. I've seen the maiden goddess ruling as queen of the underworld, and the spirits confirm this for me. It makes sense, truthfully. The maiden embodies all aspects of women's youth including the need for independence from our mothers and to forge our own identities apart from them. The myth of Persephone is much more palpable to me in that light. She's a woman of extremely assertive agency, and bastardizations of the myth that reduced her to something pretty for Hades and Demeter to fight over were only meant to take that agency from her. 
Hmm. Everything I've read about her in the Ancestor's Journal so far has made it very clear that she does not want for power, I agreed. Though, considering what I'm planning on doing, that's a little more intimidating than inspiring. And you are sure that's what you want to do? Journey to the Underworld to petition Persephone to pardon a man you barely knew? She asked. I nodded somberly, not really expecting her to understand. I knew him well enough to consider him a friend, and my interactions with him, brief though they were, ended up changing my entire life trajectory and worldview. He had a significant impact on my life, and it troubles me deeply that he suffered, died, and now trapped in Hades for all eternity because of a deal made well over a century before he was even born. I figure if a mortal convinced Persephone to do this, a mortal can convince her to undo it. And no one else is going to argue for my friend's freedom but me. This is something I have to do. Not just for him, but for me. Because I can't justify abandoning one of the few people I've felt a connection with when they need me the most. Hmm. Genevieve smiled, anxiously biting her knuckles. I really admire your conviction. Even if you don't completely understand it, I'm more than willing to help you. Tell me about your attempts to astral project so far. I start by meditating for at least 20 minutes. Then, once I'm fairly relaxed, I visualize a glowing astral body rising up from my physical body over and over until I actually start to feel myself floating in the vibrations of the astral plane, I explained. And then, I always chicken out. That's perfectly understandable. Your technique sounds good though, and I think that just having a guide with you could help you finally cross that threshold, she commented. Entheogens are also helpful, both for calming the mind and enhancing your clairvoyance. I microdose on mushrooms and have a special strain of cannabis called Delphi Dream to help get into the right headspace. Binaural music and soothing incense are good too, of course. I'm willing to try all of that, I nodded eagerly. We can do all that here, in your mediation studio? We could, but I think it would be best to do it in your cemetery, she said. It's familiar to you, where you're comfortable and close to the underworld portal. You're also used to trying with a weakened veil. I'd also like to see this place for myself. It's amazing to think I've been so close to an astral nexus all those years and had no idea. Though, I guess they're not supposed to be easy to find. She halted when she noticed I was staring at her. What? You called it a cemetery? I smiled softly. Isn't that what you said it was? She asked, confused. I did, but no one else I've ever told about it has been able to remember that for more than a moment. I explained. I've even had my parents out there, and they can't remember it's a cemetery. I... I brought my hand to my mouth, trying to stifle tears. I'm sorry, this whole thing has been weighing on me more than I've realized. And it's such a relief to finally be able to really talk about it to somebody. And I'm so sorry to burden you with all of this. I trailed off into sobs and Genevieve placed her arm around me consolingly. Samantha, you're not burdening me with anything, she swore. I've been practicing astral projection for years, but I've never been able to leave the physical plane. For years I've been searching for a way to visit the underworld or Summerland and see my goddess in person. And then you walk through my front door and tell me you've been living in an astral nexus for the past four months. Meeting you has been the best thing to happen to me in a very long time. Same, I murmured meekly. God, I'm sorry, I'm not great at this. And by this I meant, I mean, I meant whatever you mean or meant or... I don't want to misread you. Because I do that sometimes and make things awkward. But if I pretend not to notice and I wasn't misreading you, then you might get offended and things still get awkward and... Samantha? She interrupted as politely as anyone possibly could, gently sweeping back my hair. Would you like to spend the night with me? I hesitated for just a moment. I'd never slept with someone I had just met before. I didn't really think of myself as the kind of person who did that. But she was the only other witch I'd ever met. The only person who could help me and I could confide in. The only kindred spirit who could truly understand what I was going through. And she was so beautiful. I leaned in and kissed her and... I'm not actually petting an erotica here. So those are all the sexy details you're going to get about that. Sorry, I will share any unsexy detail with you though. I cried again, at one point. I hadn't had physical relations for a few years. And I guess I was in denial about how starved for affection I was. It's just that all my previous relationships, with women or men, had never really mounted to much. And I had just accepted that I didn't pair well with anyone. But Evie and I, we just clicked. I was smitten. In the morning she made me breakfast with plant protein eggs and soy bacon. And even though I had never really been able to get into vegan food before, just the fact that she cooked them for me made them wonderful. 
We packed up everything we would need, and once her shop girl was in, we set off for the cemetery. It was a beautiful early spring morning, just above freezing. Crisp, clean air filled with the singing of the newly returned birds. Lingering patches of snow and creeks and ditches flowing freely with the winter runoff. I don't get out of the city as much as I should, Genevieve remarked as we drove down Harrowick's Mile Road, admiring the majestic forest around us. I do most of my outdoor rituals in Euphemia Park, but these woods, they have a primeval, nearly pristine feel to them. Like the horned god still runs wild in them. A remnant of the once great forest our ancestors destroyed. It's sublime. Why are you slowing down? The cemetery's just up ahead, I said, pointing right. Do you see it? Look, just past the tree line. She leaned forward and squinted, but shook her head. I just see trees. Maybe a bit sparser here than before, but that's all I notice, she replied, sounding a little disappointed. I turned onto the looped path, and as soon as we passed under the arch, her face lit up in wonder. You feel it, right? Of course you do, I smiled. I've never been anywhere the veil was this thin before, she gasped. This, this really is an astral nexus, a conduit between the astral and physical planes, sacred to the great goddess, and I couldn't see it. Does, does that mean I'm not worthy to be here? Absolutely not, I said resolutely. I wasn't sure if clairvoyance was all that was required, or if there was something more. But even if there is, it's not about worthiness, I'm sure of that. The occultist that made this place sure as hell wasn't worthy. Honestly, I think it was just my fascination with cemeteries combined with my latent clairvoyance that let me see this place. I'm not special, just weird. I brought the car to a stop right in front of my trailer. And this has been my house for the past four months, I said. I know it's not even a tenth the size of your beautiful home but I find the ample yard space more than makes up for it. Oh my god, a tiny house. You have a tiny house, I love it. She screamed, leaping out of the car and excitedly running laps around my trailer. It's completely solar powered? Yep, I've got five 275 watt panels all up on my roof and 12 kilowatt hours of power storage. I explained as I got out of the car and shut both our doors. I hooked up an electrical pump to the well for water, which I did have tested, and I keep a rain barrel for backup. What about your sewage? I use a composite toilet, so I don't have any black water, and all my soap is biodegradable so my gray water is safe to just dump. I'm also going to plant a vegetable garden soon, and I'm going to build some cold frames and maybe even a small greenhouse so I can garden next winter. I'm really trying to embrace a homesteading lifestyle and become as self-sufficient as possible. You are amazing! Look at this thing! You close in your awning with a mesh net so you have an outdoor room and… Is that a hot tub? Just a little one. There's no room for a tub in the trailer, and I like to take baths. You did not do this place justice when you described it to me, she claimed. This isn't squatting, this is glamping. You are the most glamorous hedge witch in the history of hedge witches. She was the first person to ever call me a hedge witch. I liked it. So get set up, I have to feed my cat before we start. I'll be with you in a minute, I instructed. When I stepped into my trailer, I was greeted by the irritated meowing of my tabby Moxley. I know, I know. I didn't come back last night and you're hungry. I'm so sorry. I apologize as I set to work filling up a bowl of food. I have a good excuse though. I met someone. Someone wonderful. Someone kind and magic and smart and beautiful and very, very good with her fingers. I placed the bowl in front of him and gently scratched his head as he gobbled it up. She's going to help me with my astral projection today. I'm really excited about it. Though, we could be doing almost anything together and I'd be really excited about it. Can I tell you a secret, Moxley? I'm already hoping she's going to be your new mommy. I know I said I didn't want other people out here, but I think she might deserve an exemption. You can meet her in a little bit, but right now we've got important witch stuff to do. I'll be back later. I kissed him on the head and went out to join Genevieve in the cemetery, who was already sitting in the lotus position on the blanket she'd brought. The incense had been burned, her music was playing on my Bluetooth speaker, and she was once again preparing her bong. Has that microdose hit you yet? She asked. I think so. Colors are more saturated, and all my senses, including my clairvoyance, feel sharper. I replied. Good. Entheogens really do make all the difference for first-timers. The Delphi Dream will definitely make it easier to astral project. But it's right at your limit for THC, she cautioned. Do you want to try it? Yes, I think I'll be okay. I feel pretty safe here and... with you. I said shyly, sitting down across from her. 
She smiled and passed me the bong. I took a few hits off of it, and it was definitely unusual. I felt the usual calmness and euphoria I would have expected from a hybrid strain, but there was no risk of stray anxious thoughts snowballing into a panic attack. I was instead shifted into an altered state of consciousness, where my thinking was much more intuitive than my usual anxious overanalyzing. My thoughts flowed like water, and I merely watched as a detached observer. This combined with the fact that my clairvoyance was now noticeably stronger, making it almost effortless to focus on spiritual manners. Followed by the music and Genevieve's guiding voice, I soon entered a deep state of meditation. At Genevieve's instruction, I envisioned my astral body rising upwards. I felt myself levitating almost immediately, along with the higher frequency vibrations of the astral plane. This time though, I felt no fear, and I didn't stop. I just allowed it to happen. Samantha, open your eyes, I heard Genevieve say. I obediently complied, and to my amazement saw her literally radiant form floating proudly in the air. She was now as nude as the image on her shop's logo. Her flowing hair draped over her chest and a soft light emanating from her womanhood, simultaneously obscuring it while framing it as something profoundly sacred. In shock, I looked down at myself to see my glowing form hovering over my physical body. To my relief, I wasn't nude, but dressed in an approximation of what my real body was wearing. Jeans, a red hoodie, and green thermal vest, presumably because that's what I'd been imagining. I could still feel my body, I wasn't free of it, just projecting my consciousness outwards. Since my real eyes were closed, I could only see with my clairvoyance. The physical world now seemed dark and ghostly, seen through a fog and heard underwater. Only astral bodies, like myself and Genevieve, appeared bright and distinct and fully real. Thank you. I whispered softly, too stunned to my success to be excited by it. Congratulations, Samantha. You are now officially an astral projector, she cheered. Do you want to just fly around for a bit? It's fine, that's what most people do their first time. It's really cool. No, I shook my head vigorously. I've been trying to do this for months. I can't waste this opportunity. I need to seek an audience with Persephone. I turned my attention towards the rear archway, the astral portal to the underworld and I was effortlessly whisked towards it. On the astral plane, it bore little resemblance to its physical form. It was instead a colossal structure of carved onyx, its pillars made of miserable skeletal figures, eyes glowing and mouths agape, crushing beneath the weight of Hades and Persephone on their thrones. The portal itself was occluded with thick white fog, but it emanated a devastating sense of dread and despair, and I could hear the distant anguished wails of the dead on the other side and it was cold, a coldness that represented a dearth of energy and life. You, uh, might want to put on something warmer, I said half-jokingly. She grabbed my hand, and an invigorating warmth spread from her astral form and into mine. These aren't our physical bodies, and that's not physical cold. We need astral energy to keep us warm, and I have plenty of that, she assured me. Remember that we can't get trapped down there. We're still bound to our bodies, and all we have to do to end this is open our eyes. The only way to be separated from your body without dying is to achieve complete detachment from earthly desires. And I love weed, wine, and women too much to be in any danger of that. Funny that that's what's going to keep me out of hell. She paused, noticing that I was staring up in utter horror at the idols of the gods who had turned my life upside down, whose domain I now dared to trespass in. Samantha, I won't think any less of you if you don't want to do this, she promised. I shook my head, tears flowing down my cheeks. I can't give up now, I said adamantly more to myself than her. If we get separated, we'll both wake up immediately, agreed? Agreed, she nodded. Whenever you're ready, sister. I tightened my grip upon her hand, its warmth consoling me, reminding me that I wasn't walking into Hades alone as I thought I would, that I had the support and guidance of a wise and powerful witch, that I wasn't just some lone recluse daring to meddle in matters beyond her kin. With her by my side, I could do this. I inhaled deeply of the astral ether and, shoving all fear and doubt from my mind, Genevieve and I stepped through the portal to the underworld. As the mists parted and our astral form stepped through the other side of the portal, Genevieve and I beheld the grim and macabre spectacle that was the underworld. The portrait in the mausoleum didn't do it justice. It was an abysmal cavernous realm stretching far overhead and as far as I could see. 
the horizon arching upwards like the reflection of a funhouse mirror or a 360 degree panorama shot. All of the speleothems, the cave formations were monstrous in both size and shape, twisted into grotesque and appalling configurations that would be impossible under earthly physics. They were non-Euclidean, in the purely Lovecraftian sense of the word. The dark limestone glittered faintly under the pale, eerie blue light that bathed the entire hellscape, emanating from a ghostly aurora that danced high above us. A damp, gloomy fog crept along the ground while its thin, spidery clouds lazily drifted overhead in a spiraling vortex, continuously casting mutating shadows. Numerous craggy and yawning chasms glowed with a faint blue flame as well, looking like they would swallow up anyone or anything that might dare to get too close. But the horror of the landscape itself was nothing compared to that of the shades. The souls condemned to call that place home for all eternity. The ones that listlessly shambled upon the ground were still roughly human, but they were all in some state of degradation. Some looked recently deceased, most were mere skeletal wraiths of their former selves, and a few were just vaguely humanoid silhouettes that no longer bore any lingering semblance to a specific person. Worst of all were the wisps. They couldn't even really be said to possess a distinct form at all anymore. Just amorphous orbs of blue light hanging buoyantly in the dank ether. So ancient were they that they lost all memories of being human. They were so desperate to experience any trace of what they once were, they would steal biographical memories and knowledge from the living world any chance they got. But all the shades, no matter their shape, groaned and wailed and screamed. The voices forming a melancholy cacophony upon the cold and howling wind. My knees gave out beneath me, and I would have fallen had Genevieve not been there to catch me. This is hell? I wept softly, the concept still hard for me to accept, wanting so desperately for it not to be true. This is where people are left to idle and rot, bitterly reminiscing of the lives they once had over and over again as those memories fade beyond recognition until they lose any sense of what they once were and decay into undifferentiated wisps of themselves, stripped of their identity to merely exist without any sense of self until the end of time. That's what will happen to my friend if I don't get him out. Genevieve held me in her arms, staring out of the Chthonic Kingdom with a look of disillusion in her eyes. This can't be the Maiden's Goddess realm, she muttered. These souls, they're suffering. The Goddess is compassionate. She wouldn't allow this. Even if the Maiden and Mother are just different avatars of the same Goddess, Persephone is not her mother. The Ancestor's Journal made that very clear, I muttered, forcing myself to my feet and reminding myself of why I had come to this most wretched of places. The wisps aren't attacking us, at least. The journal said they can't steal identities from astral projections, but it's nice to know for sure now. You know, almost the last thing my friend said to me was that so long as I remembered him, the wisps wouldn't be able to steal his identity. Even when your soul is actually down here, just having living people keep you in their minds is enough to keep you from fading away. We stood in silence for a moment, taking in the ghastly scene before us, and trying not to be overwhelmed with existential dread. So... The plan still to petition Persephone for a pardon? Genevieve asked at last. I thought for a moment, briefly considering the possibility of searching for my friend and just taking him back ourselves. I was pretty sure it didn't work like that though, and even if it did, the vast horde of the dead before us assured me that the task would be impossible anyway. The dead outnumber the living after all. It is, I finally replied. Okay, so any idea on how to go about finding her? She asked. The plan is for her, or rather her minions, to find us, I replied. The journal said that trespassers in the underworld don't go unnoticed for very long. Let's just press forward for now and see what happens. Still hand in hand, Genevieve and I began our trek through the land of the dead. The shades didn't pay us much mind, at most sparing us a sideways glance before returning to their lethargic shuffling and willful ruminations. I wondered if I knew any of them or if any of them were people I might have heard of. I wondered what they could have possibly have done in life to deserve such a miserable fate, and what, if anything, I could do to avoid it myself. Samantha, look! Genevieve whispered, pointing towards the ground. There were luminescent white flowers of dazzling crystal poking through the cracks, droplets of ambient mist crowning them in a soft halo. Letting go of my hand, she knelt to the ground and scooped one up. It's warm! She said, an amazed smile spreading across her face. 
warm and bright like nothing else here. I think we're in the Asphodel Meadows. And these flowers are Persephone's work. They have to be. A glimmer of the Summerland in the Underworld, just like her. An ear-splitting screech pierced the sky above, and we immediately spun our heads towards its source. Three dark-winged forms descended upon us, boxing us in. Even in the gloomy underworld, they were dark. Women-shaped voids speckled in starlight, hair and wings and tails of smoke, with talons in place of fingers and toes, eyes of faint stardust glowing dully in their hollow sockets. They were the Araneus, the Furies, daughters of the primeval night. I had been expecting them. Genevieve dropped the flower and we clung to each other like frightened children, the three infernal goddesses all cackling at our cowardice. Welcome, ladies, welcome to the Realm Invisible. Always a delight to receive astral travelers, especially blessed ones like yourselves, the first one said. She stepped towards us, glaring down at us with a ravenous gaze. She lifted a tress of Genevieve's hair in her talons, taking a deep, covetous sniff. We don't get souls like yours down here often. You've come here on a quest of some kind, I take it. She tilted Genevieve's head up towards her with her sharp talon, only for her to bat it away. The Furies cackled again but made no move to discipline us. Yes, yes I have, I spoke up, trying my hardest not to seem intimidated. A friend of mine was taken here because of a deal an ancestor of his made with Persephone, and not through any fault of his own. He doesn't deserve to be here. I would like to plead with Persephone for an appeal, please. The Fury chuckled softly, and for a moment I was terrified she was going to tell me to piss off. No need to be so formal, my dear. All trespassers get an audience with our lord and lady, whether they want it or not, she said. Without warning, she grabbed us both by the shoulder, her talons digging deep into our astral forms. We screamed first in pain and then terror as she took flight, lifting us high into the ether and across the realm of the dead. We flew over all seven of the underworld's misty rivers, each of them choked with waiting shades that only parted for Karen when his fairy physically pushed them aside. As we flew deeper and deeper into the underworld, the ambient sound of forlorn weeping and gnashing of teeth was gradually replaced by something I can only describe as a clamor or a ruckus. I craned my neck towards the sound and beheld Pandemonium, the city of Dees, capital of Hades. From so high above, it was easy to see that the city was laid out in a Metatron pattern of 13 circles, one in the center surrounded by two layers of six circles each. The structures within the city were a grossly exaggerated caricature of gothic architecture, and just like the Speleothans, they were impossibly twisted constructs that would never have been allowed to stand under earthly laws. There were still some shades amongst the city's denizens, though they appeared more lucid and willful than the ones outside the city walls. But the majority of the inhabitants were the elder kin that had been described to me in the Ancestor's Journal. Some were shaped like women, like the Furies. Some were shaped like men, like the Chthonic Judges. But most were shaped like nothing living at all. No mortal creature could survive with bodies like the ones I saw. And so I had no doubt that these things had never been living at all, but were natives to the astral plane. Gods or fae, angels or demons, the names hardly matter. Their bodies were all spikes and horns and strange orifices, elongated and stunted limbs, scales and slime, every deformity and mutation imaginable, and most of all, just plain wrong. Their ethereal movements and puckish chattering left no doubt in my mind that these were the creatures whose shadows I had seen and voices I heard on Halloween, that it was these monsters who had been so fervently celebrating the yearly return of their queen. The Palace of Hades was a jet-black obsidian monstrosity perched upon an enormous rock that floated over the dead center of the city, held in place by seven colossal chains with an avalanche of fog perpetually rotting off its edges. The Furies flew us directly into the throne room and then cast us carelessly upon the gleaming floor. Cold Hades, dread Persephone, pardon the intrusion, but we found a pair of astral travelers who'd like an audience with you the lead fury announced. There, seated in a pair of ostentatious black thrones upon a hovering obsidian dais, were Hades and Persephone. Both appeared mostly as they had in the portrait. Fair-skinned, dark-robed, white-haired, eyes burning with the same blue glow that saturated the entire underworld. Hades was lean of build with no beard, his features chiseled but stern, his expression stoic, 
He wore a multi-tongued black crown upon his head, studded with the same crystal flowers we had seen in the Asphodel Meadows. His bident stood erect and within reach should he have need of it. Persephone herself was stunningly beautiful, luminously resplendent amongst the gloom of the underworld, her slender form doing nothing to diminish the gravitas of her presence. Her long, pale blonde hair, gleaming like white gold, was crowned with a coronet of woven crystal flowers, her aura brighter and warmer and more energetic than anything else in the entire underworld, marked her as a foreigner in her own kingdom. But I suddenly understood why her subjects loved her so much, why Hades loved her so much. She made their world brighter just by being here, and the summer land was no doubt darker for her absence. Her smile was the brightest light they ever saw, her laughter their greatest music, her mere existence a reminder that a better reality existed somewhere and that it was possible to return to it even after having fallen into hell. This effect seemed to be even stronger upon Genevieve, who immediately began to grovel and weep. Hail, hail fair maiden goddess, goddess of the spring and dawn and waxing moon, ever young avatar of the great triple goddess, goddess of new life and queen of the underworld, she sobbed in a faint whisper. Most blessed art thou, most hallowed art thou, most, most, I, I, I am humbled and grateful to be in your presence, fairest Persephone. The goddess arched her eyebrow in slight amusement, but otherwise seemed unmoved by Genevieve's display of piety. It's dread, Persephone, she corrected her, sounding slightly annoyed. And my husband's here too, you know. To disrespect him is to disrespect me. Genevieve shook with terror at having displeased her goddess, and appeared incapable of responding. So, for her, I stood up and bowed to Hades. Hades, Pluton, Lord of the Underworld and Zeus Chthonic, King of the Realm Invisible, thank you for granting us this audience, I said. My name is Samantha. Persephone smiled, her eyes lighting up with recognition as she shifted upright in her throne. You... you know me? I stammered, completely dumbfounded that the Queen of the Underworld knew who I was. Of course, you're the dabbler who's taken up residence in the Harrowick Cemetery, she replied. I do keep track of the astral nexuses I created, and I was fully expecting that one to fade out after I'd claimed the last of that bloodline. What a delightful surprise it was when you found it and claimed it as your own. Congratulations on making it down here, by the way. It's been nearly five years since anyone's made an Orphean trek, and I wasn't even here. The Deathless Merchant of London came to retrieve a business associate of his. Can you believe that? He journeyed to Hades not for love, or glory, or divine secrets, but to fulfill a contractual obligation. Truly bizarre. Oh, but I won't waste your time with anecdotes. I have other business to attend to, and I'm certain you don't want to be down here any longer than absolutely necessary. You've made it this far, so say what you've come here to say. I nodded, swallowed nervously, and stepped as close to the dais as I dared. This past Hallow's Eve, in the unnamed cemetery of Harrowick Woods, a man offered himself to your wisps as a sacrifice, and his soul now resides here, I began. He only did this because you, or those working at your behest, had tormented him and his family. I, therefore, asserted sacrifice was coerced and not done freely, and that you have no rightful claim upon him. It was his ancestor, not him, who promised his soul to you, and that was not theirs to barter with. He was my friend, and it pains me to know that he is to suffer here for all eternity. For both his sake and mine, I ask for your pity and that you release him from this realm. I stopped, because that was all I had. Rose lawyering the Queen of the Underworld may not have been the best tactic, but I really didn't know what else to do. Persephone herself didn't appear to be particularly moved either. You still don't even know his name, do you? She asked, a tone of derision in her voice. He was not your blood, or your lover. Merely a vagrant who happened to share your affinity for cemeteries, whom you knew for less than a month. That hardly seems like a loss worth upending the natural order of life and death to rectify. Yes, he was only a friend, but that is not a title I give out lightly. I replied, but I'm not asking you to do it for me. I'm asking that he be released for no other reason than his damnation here is unjust. Samantha, when your friend's ancestor made their bargain with me, 
they became one of my subjects. A citizen of the underworld, Persephone explained. Surely you're not arguing it's an injustice that citizenry is hereditary. By that logic, your own citizenship to your earthly nation is an injustice. Your friend and his entire bloodline were my subjects. I had every right to demand that they return here upon their deaths and to punish them for disobedience. The truth is that none of us consent to our own creation, and for good or ill, we are forever bound by the actions of those who came before us. Your friend is no exception. I have every right to his soul, and I will not be releasing him. Angry tears began to well in my eyes, and I impotently clenched my fists as I tried to restrain myself from screaming. He didn't do anything, I persisted. His wife, his child, who you killed didn't do anything. How can I accept any ruling you make as just when you would condemn an innocent child to this hell for all eternity? It was then that Hades first stirred on his throne, his indifference shifting to indignation, and my display of indolence, his hand poised to grab his bident in a blink of an eye. The rest of the court adopted their lord's demeanor, and stood at the ready to strike me down should I take one more step out of line. Even Kerberos was growling at me and I did not want to find out what it felt like to be ripped apart by those three set of jaws. Persephone, though, grabbed her husband's hand and held up her free palm to tell the court to stand down. She then gave me a weary nod. A nod of a god who was well accustomed to accusations that they were not all benevolent. Samantha, I realize this may offend your modern, egalitarian sensibilities, but obtaining entry into the Earth Mother's Summerland or the Sky Father's Empyrean requires meeting certain moral and spiritual criteria, which not everyone does, she claimed. And those are not arbitrary standards on their part either. Astral bodies are governed by karma, just as physical bodies are by gravity. Unworthy souls are simply not capable of ascending to or remaining in the higher regions of the astral plane. Were it not for the underworld, they would remain earthbound poltergeists. Not only would such a vast number of restless spirits on earth cause untold havoc, but their collective presence would weaken the veil enough that the physical constants of your world would be noticeably less constant, rendering all the science and technology based upon them useless. Earth would be a demon-haunted world both literally and figuratively, and it is only thanks to the underworld that my husband and I maintain that it is not. Worse yet, some of those souls would be at risk of falling even lower than Earth into Tartarus or the darkness below, which I assure you would be a far worse fate than anything that exists in this realm. This is not a prison. It is a poor house. We take in the spiritually destitute, but we are not the cause of their destitution. For both their sake and the sake of Earth, we maintain an astral realm where those unworthy of paradise may seek shelter, but it was not us who made them unworthy of it. As with any poor house, not everyone here is happy, but some do make better use of our charity than others. And make no mistake, it is charity, a necessary yet often thankless service that we provide, one we would not be doing if we were not just. And that, young dabbler, is why you can trust that my ruling is fair. I calmed down a little bit. She was naturally persuasive, as was the court of the damned at her beck and call and I got the impression that she at least believed what she was saying. But I wasn't willing to give up. But, but surely a person's karma isn't fixed upon their death. Can the shades of the underworld not still become worthy of ascending to a better afterlife? Is there anything, anything I can do to help my friend? I pleaded. Please? A cold, calculating glare overtook Persephone's face, and in that moment I knew that she was not thinking about whether or not it was possible but whether or not to tell me. As it stands, your friend is not worthy of ascending to the Summerland, and I see no reason to let him roam free upon the earth, she said at last. Go back to your body, dabbler, study your craft, and perhaps one day you may be able to change my mind. No, Persephone, please, please don't send me back empty-handed. This can't all have been for nothing. I'm not going back without him, I screamed. Enough, she said briskly giving a slight commanding gesture to her husband. Hades rose from his throne, bident in hand, his eyes burning brighter as the rest of him darkened like a storm cloud. I froze in horror as he lunged towards me, his bident poised to strike. I have no idea what would have happened if it hit me, because in that instant, Genevieve sprung back to life, 
throwing her arms around me and commanding us both to wake up. Our eyes shot open, and we were back in our bodies in the cemetery, gasping for breath and hearts pounding out of our chests. Despite the adrenaline rush, the horrors of what I'd just seen, and the consequences of my unsuccessful deal with Persephone immediately overwhelmed me. I fell to the ground, curled up into a ball, and just started sobbing. Samantha! Samantha! Genevieve cried, rushing to my side and lovingly cradling me in her arms. Samantha, are you okay? No, I squeaked with a pathetic shake of my head. I failed. My astral trip to the underworld was a turning point in my life, more so than anything else that came before. In the months that I'd spent in the cemetery studying the ancestors' occult library, there was still a nagging voice in the back of my head that said I was crazy and none of it was real. But once I had actually managed to astral project and visit the spirit world, those doubts were gone for good. The astral plane was real, and if anything, the physical plane was the fantasy world. This revelation sparked a passion in me unlike anything I'd felt before, and mastering the craft became the driving purpose in my life. Genevieve was the best teacher I could have hoped for, and helping me to understand that being a good witch also meant being a good Wiccan. My earlier attempts at solidary study had been hindered by being overly analytical. Genevieve taught me that faith is not the rejection of reason, merely the acknowledgement of its limitations. Properly honed intuitions and emotions, crafted by millions of years of natural selection, can be just as powerful for inferring truth. This is especially true when there is not the required time or evidence for rational analysis, or when dealing with other worlds which, by their very nature, do not conform to our laws. The fact that I had only first succeeded in astral projection when the Delphi dream had granted me a much more intuitive state of mind was all the proof I needed, that it was the better approach to understanding the spirit world. I have an altar now, a small oak table draped in a purple velvet triple moon tapestry. It's light enough that I can move it around the cemetery when I want to, but I usually keep it in the maintenance shed where it won't get wet. On it, I have candles for fire, incense for air, salt and gemstones for earth, and a filled chalice for water. I have my athema, feathers from the crows of my cemetery, a wand made from a willow branch, a small cauldron, mortar and pestle, my book of shadows, and a pentacle talisman. There are two small busts, one of the mother goddess and one of the horned god, and two figurines, a crone with a staff and cloak, and winged Isis, who I worship as an amalgam of all three goddesses. I do not, however, have any idol of the maiden goddess on my altar, for reasons which I expect are clear. Every day now I kneel by my altar, light the candles, burn the incense, and pray. Genevieve also helped me to realize that the purpose of prayer is not that a god answers, or even that there is a literal entity who identifies as the god you're praying to to hear from. All forms of magic are based on the effect consciousness has on reality, and praying helps to clearly crystallize your thoughts and desires in your mind, and repetition reinforces them. Words are thoughts given physical form, and speaking or writing them helps make them more real. Genevieve and I are also great believers in the openness and interconnectedness of all things, and that spells and prayers spread out through that interconnectedness to influence reality, including the god we're praying to if we're lucky. It's nothing short of ironic that after realizing all this was when a goddess actually did choose to acknowledge my prayers. It was June of last year, about three months after I had visited the underworld. Genevieve and I had gone on astral journeys many times since then, but I refused to go anywhere near the portal behind the tree line, be it in spirit or in the flesh. I had just stepped out of my shed when I saw a blonde woman sitting in a lawn chair by my fire pit, my cat Moxley on her lap. For a second I just assumed it was Genevieve, because who else would it be? But Genevieve doesn't drive or own a car, and even if she did, she wouldn't be able to find the cemetery on her own. I was still the only person I knew who could do that. Hey! I shouted, stomping towards her. The anger that anyone had dared to trespass into my sacred cemetery overriding any sense of caution. The woman looked up at me and smiled. The same smug smile I had seen countless times from the portrait in the mausoleum. And I froze in my tracks. It was Persephone. She looked a little different from when I had seen her in the underworld. 
Her skin was sun-kissed, her hair crowned in a coronet of actual flowers instead of gemstones, and she was now clad in only a gossamer summer dress. Hey to you too, she smirked, gently stroking Moxley's fur. How's your summer been? Mine's been dreadfully dull, but all my summers are like that. I miss my kingdom. I miss my king. I miss my dog. Like Mark Twain, I go to heaven for the climate and hell for the company. Dread Persephone, I murmured softly as I bowed in obligatory reverence to her, terrified of what she might be planning or doing. Actually, Ferris Persephone is fine now, given the season, she assured me. Though, I do appreciate the reminder of my proper honorific. How are you here? I asked, bewildered. From everything I thought I understood about the outer kin, they shouldn't be able to cross the veil except at liminal times and places. Reverse astral projection, let's call it. My astral form is in the Summerland, but I'm projecting my mind into a rudimentary physical body I made from ambient matter, she said nonchalantly. It's hard, even with a weakened veil, and I could have just projected an image into your mind had I just wanted to talk, but I thought I should pay this nexus of mine a visit. Even after all this time, it really is quite charming. I can see why you love it so much. Come now, don't just stand there. Sit by my side, and we'll talk a bit. I think it would be good for us to talk here, instead of in the far more formal setting of my court. Don't you? I nodded and sat down in the chair adjacent to her. It was a rare opportunity to actually be able to converse with a deity, and I wasn't going to waste it. Are you what Genevieve thinks you are? I asked curiously. An emanation of a specific aspect from a pan-psychic pantheistic Brahmin oversoul? Words, 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 she chuckled. I think the Skyfather said it best with, I am that what I am. If it appeals to any lingering materialism you may still possess, you can think of the universe as a simulation and me as a mod. But that's still just a metaphor, and no more or less valid than the metaphors used by the most primitive shamans. But the answer to what I am will always be beyond your understanding. I nodded again and decided not to waste my limited time with her with any more metaphysics. Then explain this to me then. Why can't you just let me have my friend back? I asked, my voice cracking a bit as I did so. I'm not arguing whether you have the authority to keep him. I'll admit that you do. But why do you care? I'm not even asking for him to be brought back to life. I just want his soul. What does one soul mean to you? She drew pensive, seemingly considering her response very carefully. Identity is very important to my people, Samantha. Far more so than it is to mortals, she began. The astral plane is far more malleable to thought than this world is, and thus our bodies are much more accurate reflections of our true nature. Before I was the queen of the underworld, I was nothing more than my mother's daughter. In her mind and the minds of many others, she is the perfect mother and ideal of feminine authority. She is selfless to the point of self-destruction when need be, viewing her power solely as responsibility and never as a privilege, incapable of being corrupted or deluded by it. She is the embodiment of pure compassion and lives only to care for others, but to live under such a benefactor can be smothering and infantilizing. And that was to be my fate for all eternity. I was her daughter, to care for and dote over and, most of all, to protect. I was to spend my eternity in the Summerland where I'd be safe, helping the mortal souls who came there for respite and reflection from the cycle of rebirth until they were ready to return to Earth or ascend higher yet. That was to be my only reward for my toil. The warm, fuzzy feeling of knowing I helped people. I didn't even have to worry about screwing it up as my mother would always be hovering over me, ready to correct any mistakes her hapless idiot daughter made. She loves me, I know she does, but she did not respect me. When I told her that I wasn't as selfless as her and that I wasn't happy with the life she had ordained for me, she just assured me I would grow out of it, that she knew me better than I knew myself, and that she knew what was best for me. She wanted me safe and I wanted to be free. The most proverbial parent-child conflict of them all. My growing unhappiness did start to impact her own sense of identity, however, as I was making it increasingly difficult for her to view herself as a perfect mother. 
and my rebellions against her only made that worse. In particular, she viewed herself as extremely progressive and permissive, and it harmed none, do as thou wilt, right? As such, I was free to frolic with gods and goddesses, nymphs and satyrs, and any mortal souls in any combination and manner that pleased me. Then I fell in love with the lord of the underworld, and she did not like that one bit. May I ask why? I interrupted. Same reason most people don't like him, I imagine, she shrugged. He tends to the lost souls those of us on the higher levels of the astral plane would prefer not to think about. No, I mean, why did you fall in love with him? I clarified and pondering whether she had legitimately misunderstood me, or if she had been trying to deflect the question. Oh, well, there and now, I view love more as a primordial force than a rational choice, one even the gods are powerless to resist. It just happened. But if I must give reasons, I admire the quiet dignity with which he conducted his thankless work, the paradise he had made in hell. He also gave me something I could never get from my mother. Respect. He never spoke down to me, always treated me as an adult and equal. I respected him in turn and was willing to become his queen and aid him in his work, which I deemed far more rewarding than playing guidance counselor to the blessed souls of the Summerland. My mother, of course, was devastated at my choice to spend eternity in the gloomy underworld with its lost souls. She did everything in her power to rescue me, to save me, and when she couldn't, she viewed herself as a complete failure as a mother and fell into a deep depression, and the entire Summerland began to decay with her. It was partially a Fisher King scenario and partially because she was neglecting her duties that no one else could do. I was her main assistant and I was gone. The crone is wise but old and limited in the amount of work she can do. My father, the horned god, is obedient to my mother to the point that he's usually useless without her giving him orders. But like all my people, his identity is essential to his existence, and his identity is that of the ideal son, lover, and father, willing to do anything to protect and provide for his family, even die. So that's what he did. It's hard to describe what he did in literal terms, but he made a sacrifice that saved the Summerland, but simultaneously made him unworthy of it, and he descended to the underworld. I hadn't quite realized things had gotten that bad without me, that my mother couldn't be the mother without me as the maiden. I hated being the maiden though, and I loved being queen of the underworld. But how could I in good consciousness keep my throne knowing that my mother already in the grip of crippling depression had just lost her beloved consort because she couldn't attend to her duties? The astral plane needed both the Summerland and the Underworld, and the Summerland needed the Maiden Goddess, but the Underworld could survive without a queen. If I were as selfless as my mother, I would have returned to the Summerland forever, but I'm not, so I didn't. Instead, I proposed a compromise. I would not forsake my identity as the Maiden Goddess, but nor would I forsake my preferred identity as the Queen of the Underworld. I would forever be both worlds and split my time between the two. My mother accepted these terms, and I returned to the Summerland. With me by my mother's side, it was healed enough that what my father had sacrificed could be restored to him and he was resurrected come spring. My mother still doesn't really approve of my life choices, but she accepts them. And though she misses me dearly, she is able to maintain the Summerland during my absence, knowing we'll be reunited again on Beltane. So, you see, Samantha, I, like many gods, have a dichotomy to my existence between Ferris Persephone and Dread Persephone, between the dutiful daughter and the rebel daughter, between the Disney princess and the Disney queen. She held out two fingers, whistled, and a chirping songbird came and perched upon them. With a sinister smirk, she blew upon it, and it instantly fell dead to the ground. Compassion for its own sake is a trait of Ferris Persephone, and any indulgence in compassion in my capacity as Queen of the Underworld compromises that identity. My preferred identity. The one I made for myself and will maintain until the end of time no matter what the cost. You have offered me no reason to return your friend to you other than pity, and it takes an enormous amount of pity for me to be willing to act as Ferris Persephone while I sit by my husband's side. Don't get me wrong, it is sweet that you care about your friend this much, but you're no Orpheus mourning for Eurydice. 
I sat silently, contemplating what she had said. That all sounded like a very convoluted way of saying that you just don't want to, I muttered, hanging my head. I suppose it is, she smirked. I understand if that explanation doesn't bring you any comfort, but I have some questions for you now, if you don't mind. And what would those be? I asked. Well, Samantha, I know that since you came to see me, you've been exploring these woods, both on and off the trails, wondering if there was any truth to the old legends you read about, she replied. You found the green man, didn't you? The green man is a nature spirit that resides in and watches over Harrowick Woods. He usually takes the form of a tall sylvan satyr. With my clairvoyance, he wasn't hard to find once I started looking. I did, I admitted, not seeing any point in lying, even though I suspected I knew where she was going with this. How could you not? He's very hard for someone like you to miss, she noted. And, being a devotee of my father, he would have been all too eager to aid a witch. I can only imagine the first thing you would have asked him was how to help your friend, and I'm sure his first suggestion was to make him your spirit familiar. That way he'd be anchored to you and unable to descend back to the underworld, and in your service he may even be able to rack up enough karma to ascend to the Summerland someday. Am I wrong? I sighed but gave a resigned nod. That's exactly what he had told me. But, as much as you miss your friend, you haven't tried anything yet, she went on. I assume then that you're waiting until Halloween, when the veil is weakest and when I, hopefully, am distracted by my welcome home party. I've come here to tell you that's not going to work, Samantha. I've made my decision. I know what you're up to, and I will not be made a fool of. I admire your persistence, really, I do, but do not think for an instant that you can defy me. You think that just because you read some old grimoires, walked across the plains and danced naked around a bonfire with your little girlfriend that you're an all-powerful witch? You are a dabbler, and any expertise you think you may possess is pure Dunning-Kruger effect. You don't have the slightest idea how much you don't know, how much you cannot understand. If you try to trick me, or steal from me, you will fail. And, for reasons I've already explained, I will not be merciful. This is not a threat. This is a warning. I like you, and I don't want to have to punish you, but I will if you attempt to circumvent my ruling. If you really want me to release him to you as a familiar, continue to study your craft until you advance enough that you can actually offer me something worthy in exchange. I believe you have that in you, Samantha, and it's something I'd actually be willing to agree to. Well, I don't think I'd be willing to agree to a deal in your terms, knowing what I know about you, I said adamantly. I don't want to be your subject. I don't want to end up in your underworld, and I sure as hell don't want to condemn any innocent descendants I may have to that fate. You may be a goddess, but you're no god with a capital G. You're not all-powerful, or even supremely powerful, and you're not the sole arbiter of the fate of mortal souls. I am not afraid of you. I'm not giving in to you. And if I do save my friend, it will be on my terms, not yours. Go to hell, now, please. I grimaced as she picked up Moxley and held him to her face, presumably contemplating killing him just to punish me for my outburst. You're lucky it's summer and you're cute, she told him before setting him down on the ground. She then looked up at me with pity, pity that I knew I would not receive should I cross her while she was not under her mother's thumb. If you ever change your mind about that, just holler, and I swear, I won't hold anything against you, she assured me before dissipating into a spray of mist. I scooped Moxley up in my arms and clutched him to my chest, nuzzling his head while sobbing, wondering what the hell I had just done. I had no real reason to believe I could ever defy Persephone, and every reason to believe that bowing to her whim was my only hope of helping my friend. But as I said, I was committed to trusting my intuition now and my intuition told me I was missing something. I felt that something was off, that something didn't quite make sense, and I was just on the cusp of my conscious mind realizing what it was. I felt then, and know now, that I was only one more epiphany or revelation away from being able to rescue my friend, with or without Persephone's approval. I just hoped that I would have that epiphany before the next Halloween. Summer went by without me making any obvious progress towards my goal of somehow making my dead friend into my spirit familiar against Persephone's wishes. 
I didn't stumble upon a lead until one night in late September, when Genevieve and I went out for dinner and a couple of pints of craft beer at a tavern on Queen Street called the Undying Rose. I'm not much for nightlife, but it was quiet enough and had a beer garden that offered a view of the Avalon River. Genevieve and I had to split an entree though, since despite the fro-fro name, I'm pretty sure their core clientele is 200 plus pound straight guys. It was, however, that name and the tavern's logo of a dark purple rose that really caught my interest. You may recall that the rose left upon the ancestor's grave was also purple, and seemingly undying. When I realized this, I replanted the rose, and to my delight, it took root and grew into a small bush. Recently though, it had started to nag at me that no matter how thoroughly I read through the ancestors' books, I could find no mention of it. It seemed very odd to me, given how meticulously they had been with journaling their occult activities, and the only explanation I could think of was that maybe it had been a later acquisition by one of their descendants. But the Undying Rose got me thinking about it again, and luckily the owner happened to be in that night. I asked him about the tavern's name and history, and he said that it dated back to at least the early 19th century, but that the exact date an original owner had been lost to time. None of the subsequent owners had ever changed the name though, so it had always been the Undying Rose. I thanked him and spent the rest of my night pondering the implications. It seemed entirely possible that the tavern had originally belonged to my friend's ancestor, and that name was in reference to the rose from the graveyard. But why? Afterwards, I took Genevieve out to my cemetery to spend the night. I'd only had two pints over a couple of hours and a full stomach, so I was good to drive. Once we were home, we smoked some weed, made love, then passed into a deep, pleasant sleep. It was a good night. While I slept though, I had the same dream I had the first night I'd spent in the cemetery. It had become one of my most frequently recurring dreams. I knew it was trying to tell me something, but since it was always exactly the same, it had to be something that I was overlooking. I watched the same scene I had watched many times before. The shrouded ancestor carrying out their ritual to turn the cemetery into an astral nexus, then coming to rest in the dead center and... Then it hit me. I wondered how I had never realized it before. Though, I suppose critical thinking skills aren't at their sharpest during REM sleep. The ancestor was standing in the exact center of the cemetery, where the mausoleum was. It wasn't there yet. It wasn't originally part of the cemetery, but something that had been built after the ancestor had made it hollowed ground. But why would they do that? Ostensibly as a tribute to Hades and Persephone, I'm sure. But at that moment, I was certain there was some ulterior motive to it. I jolted awake just before sunrise. The epiphany I had been waiting for finally cleared in my mind, and I knew what I had to do. Evie, Evie, get dressed! I commanded as I shook her awake, jumping out of bed and scrambling into my own clothes. What? What? Why? She asked groggily. I need your help right now, I said hurriedly. You need shoes and your sunglasses and as much protection as you can find. Before she could ask any follow-up questions, I was already out the door and in the maintenance shed, donning my gardening gloves, safety goggles, and grabbing a pair of rusty old sledgehammers that were far older than I was. Wait, Samantha, stop. What are we doing? Genevieve asked as she chased after me. I need to see who or what's entombed in the mausoleum. I explained as I resolutely marched towards it. Entombed in the... You mean we're smashing it open? She asked us maid. Why? I dreamed in the cemetery being hollowed again. Only this time I realized that the mausoleum wasn't there. I told her. The occultists made the mausoleum after. And they must have had a very specific reason for doing that. There's something crucial in that tomb and I need to know what. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Baby, 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 slow down. She urged me. This could be dangerous. Desecrating the tomb might enrage Persephone. Or it might have other occult protections. And what about you? I know how much you love this place. Do you really want to vandalize it? I paused by the mausoleum door, considering what she'd said. I have to know for sure, I replied grimly, fully aware I was echoing what my friend said when I caught him digging up the ancestor's grave. I pushed the door open, threw off the tablecloth covering the tomb, and immediately set to work smashing it open. Genevieve and I aren't exactly ideally built for that sort of manual labor, but we pummeled the top slab of marble until it was in small enough pieces for us to remove by hand. 
When the tomb was finally open, we beheld a body wrapped entirely in a scarlet burial shroud, embroidered with golden sigils. What the hell? That shroud looks brand new, Genevieve remarked. How is that possible if it's been rotting here for 200 years? I didn't answer. In fact, I barely registered she said anything. I was mesmerized by the pristine shroud. The implications for the body beneath it all too clear. Evie, brace yourself, I cautioned as I pulled back the shroud, revealing the perfectly preserved body of an elderly man. His skin had the exact same pale silvery pallor as my friend. His hair, bushy with a prominent widow's peak, was just as white, along with a pointed beard and long handlebar mustache. He had a pronounced pointed nose and sunken cheeks, and his bony fingers clutched a leather-bound book in purple rose to his chest. An incorruptible corpse, like the one you said your friend dug up? Genevieve asked in wonder. I nodded and slowly pulled the book out of the corpse's hands. Other than being room temperature, it didn't feel like a dead body at all. I succeeded in freeing the book, and when I opened it my eyes began to tear up with joy at what I saw on the first page. The Journal of Arctaxerxes Crow. I read aloud, my voice flooded with pride, satisfaction, and relief. Artaxerxes? Genevieve asked in disbelief. Wait, Crow? As in Crow, Crowley, and Chamberlain? The old financial firm of Druid Street? Almost certainly, I said softly, though I was hardly concerned with that at the time. Evie, this is my friend's ancestor. The occultist who made the deal with Persephone and created this place. I knew it didn't make sense that he would be buried in some random grave. The first time my friend told me that, I knew it didn't make sense. He was on the right track though. That must have been what drove him to dig up the grave. But then who's buried out there? She asked. No idea. Just someone Arctaxerxes sacrificed to the wisps in his place, I surmised. Genevieve, I don't know how he did it, or even exactly what he did other than that it involves the roses in the mausoleum in some way. But somehow he cheated Persephone. He condemned every one of his descendants to a fate that he weaseled out of, the bastard. This is unreal, Genevieve murmured with an incredulous shake of her head. When she was finally able to pull her eyes away from the body, she saw that I had a shit-eating grin plastered across my face. Samantha, baby, why are you smiling? His soul is still in there. Can't you feel it? I asked. I hadn't noticed it at first either but I could clearly sense the presence of a soul within the corpse. He's astral projecting, but his soul is still bound to his earthly vessel, which is why he hasn't fallen into the underworld despite being such an epic piece of shit. He's literally been evading divine justice for centuries. So, why are you smiling? Genevieve repeated. Persephone is going to want to make Artaxerxes pay for what he did. I whispered, gesturing to her portrait. She made it very clear to me that she will not tolerate being tricked or cheated. She'll want him, and she can have him, for a price. Genevieve stared at me aghast, like I'd just gone completely insane. You're saying you're going to ask Persephone for your friend back in exchange for this asshole? She asked bewildered. Not to ask, demand, I said resolutely. We'll set up wards that the outer kin can't cross like last Halloween, and if Persephone won't agree to my terms, then she's out of luck. Genevieve took a step back, her body quaking at my proposed sacrilege. Samantha, baby, I really don't know about this, she murmured. I love you, but Persephone is still the maiden goddess. Still our goddess. Forcing her hand like that seems disrespectful. And dangerous. Maybe we should just let Persephone have him, and she can decide if and how to reward us. For a moment, I was hurt. She knew how much this meant to me, and now that I finally had an ace in the hole, she just wanted me to give it up? But I knew how much her faith meant to her, and that I really was asking a lot. I understand, I said, hanging my head in resignation. And I'll understand if you don't want to have anything to do with this. But that's not going to stop me. I, I, I'm a Wiccan now too, and I do want to revere and respect all incarnations of our goddess, but... There's still a humanistic streak in me that thinks standing up to a tyrannical god who could torture me for all eternity is the most righteous act I could ever do. Goddess or not, Persephone wronged a fellow human being that I called my friend, and if I can hold her accountable for that, I will. Genevieve just stood there, tears welling in her eyes. I could tell she wanted to talk me out of it, but knew that she couldn't. I could tell she wanted to tell me that she wouldn't have any part in it, but knew that she couldn't do that either. 
She looked at me, then at the portrait of Persephone, and then back to me. Fuck it, she said. The great thing about being a polytheist is that if you piss one god off, you got plenty more to choose from. We spent the next few weeks preparing for our Halloween party, consulting our occult tomes and readying everything we would need. And soon, Sam Hain was upon us. I had turned Moxley into my animal familiar as practice, and it went off without a hitch. We both became able to communicate with each other much more intuitively, even when we were apart if one of us wanted to, and he developed a very uncat-like obedience to my instructions. I left him at Genevieve's house for safety with her animal familiar, a black cat named Nightshade, both of whom were to be taken care of as part of Genevieve's estate should we not return. We could tell both of them knew something was up, and they were worried, but they obeyed our orders to stay at the house. After a heartfelt goodbye with our darling kitties, we set out for the cemetery. We had carved a large triple moon sigil into the ground with a pentagram for a full moon, and filled the lines with black salt. There were twelve jack-o'-lanterns, one for each point on the pentagram, and one to sit between the tips of each crescent moon. They weren't carved with faces though, but with carefully selected sigils and glyphs, meant to ward off chthonic or ill-meaning spirits and ensure the protection of the mother goddess and horned god. We had similar sigils drawn on our bodies or inscribed on our clothes. We both wore pentagram talismans and pointed hats, serving both as festive costumes and ceremonial attire. I had selected a long flowing black dress for the occasion, whereas Genevieve, who cannot abide restrictive clothing, wore only a deep green mini dress. My hair was half a foot longer than it had been a year before, I hadn't cut it in all that time since I thought a witch should have long beautiful hair, and a witch was what I was now. Within the center of the pentagram were myself, Genevieve, and the incorruptible corpse of Arctaxerxes Crow. I had brought my altar out as well, along with the addition of the jack-o'-lantern shaped candle holder I had placed on my friend's memorial nearly a year ago. It was our lucky 13th jack-o'-lantern, and I had drawn a sigil on it as well. It was what I intended to bind my friend to should I succeed in freeing him from the underworld. As soon as the sun set we began our rituals, lighting the hollowed virgin candles in their hollowed pumpkins. We danced, chanted and prayed, recited oral spells, and burned written ones in the candle flames. This went on for nearly two hours until dusk finally fell, when the veil was the weakest it would be all year, and the will of the wisps began to appear over the gravestones. Persephone would now be able to come here in her astral form, and all I had to do was summon her. It is All Hallows' Eve, and the great god Pan is dead. I pontificated, grabbing my walking stick that I had engraved with sigils and topped with a crescent moon, a string of select gemstones dangling from the upper tip. The god of the hunt and harvest has sacrificed himself to ensure the survival of his people. We thank and praise him for this sacrifice, and grieve with the mother goddess at the loss of her consort. As the horned god descends into the underworld, so too doth the maiden, so that she may take her rightful seat by Hades' side, and grant her father dispensation to be resurrected once again come spring. But before she sits upon her obsidian throne, I would like to have a word with her. I drew the invocation sigils into the dirt with my stave, and Genevieve filled it with white salt crystals. Dread Persephone, summer maiden and winter queen, Heed my summons under waxing crescent, to cross the veil on this Halloween, and greet me in my presence, for speaking of things that need bespoke. From this moment hence, thy powers do I thus invoke. Let our bargaining commence. As soon as I had finished the spell, there was a bright blue flash from behind the tree line, where the spirit portal was, and seconds later the astral form of Persephone came marching forth, the wisps reverently lowering themselves to the ground in her presence. Persistent as ever, aren't we, Samantha? She said as she came to a stop behind the protective wards we had made. At least you're not trying to steal from me. All right then, I'll humor you for a moment. What little trick have you learned that you think might be worth me giving you your friend back? No tricks. A treat. I smiled, bending down and pulling off Artaxerxes' burial shroud. Recognize this guy? Finally, I saw that smug smile leave her face as she just stared completely dumbfounded. That's... 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 she murmured. Artaxerxes Crow! I finished for her. 
body and soul. If I'm not mistaken, he agreed to sacrifice both of those to your wisps in exchange for your services. He cheated you, Persephone, made a fool of you, which I do recall you saying were things that you wouldn't tolerate. She attempted to cross the outer circle to seize him, but the wards held firm. Give him to me, she ordered, her face distorting in otherworldly rage. I'm not one of your subjects or followers, Persephone. You have no authority over me. I proclaimed, if you want Arxaxerxes, it will be on my terms. She glared at me in wrath and shock, but then let out an acquiescent snicker. All right, all right, fine. You win. Give me Arctaxerxes and you can have your friend as a familiar, she agreed. Not good enough, I told her. You need to forfeit your claim on every single one of Arctaxerxes' descendants and let any that are able to leave the underworld. What? She growled, an enraged expression returning to her face. Artaxerxes broke the terms of your agreement. That means the entire contract is invalid, and you no longer have any right to those souls. Release them, and you can have him. I replied. You want me to give up seven generations of descendants for one man? That's nearly twelve dozen souls. She screeched. My conditions are non-negotiable. Take them or leave them, I said coldly. Persephone screamed and howled, bashing at the invisible barrier that kept her at bay. I couldn't help but smirk, remembering how she had so condescendingly assured me that I had no idea what I was doing, and that I would be powerless to defy her. After a minute, she managed to regain some composure, and I watched her eyes flitter back between me and Arctaxerxes trying to decide who she wanted to punish more. State your full terms, she said at last. You can have him if you swear on the river Styx to forsake your claim to all of Arctaxerxes' descendants and release the blessed ones from the underworld, to give me the name of the man who died here last year and let me bind him to me as a familiar, and that neither you or anyone at your behest will ever harm or harass me or my loved ones or trespass in my cemetery, I answered. I swear on the river Styx to forsake my claim on all of Arctaxerxes' descendants and to release the blessed ones from the underworld, to give you the name of the man who died here last year and let you bind him to yourself as a familiar, and that neither myself or anyone at my behest will ever harm or harass you or your loved ones or trespass in your cemetery, she repeated. Now, give him to me. I admit, this was still a bit of a gamble, since I wasn't actually sure if an oath sworn on the river Styx was truly unbreakable. But it was a risk I had to take. Genevieve and I picked the corpse up by each end, carried him to the edge of the wards, and threw him across it. Persephone caught him with superhuman strength and agility, cradling him like he was a baby she intended to devour, a gleefully sadistic smile spreading across her face. She gave me a wayward glance, and I began to wonder if I had made a terrible mistake. His name is Alam, Alam Crow, she sighed. Don't push your luck with me again, Dabbler, or I swear, on the river Styx, that I'll find a way around my oath to make you pay for your insolence. With that, she flew through the portal in a single bound, carrying Artaxerxes across the veil with her. I wonder at the physics of that now, carrying a material body into the underworld. But it was hardly my priority at the time. I grabbed my wand and traced the sigil I'd assigned for Elam in the air seven times. Elam crow, 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 crow, I shouted each time I drew the sigil. I then knelt by my altar and grasped the jack-o'-lantern candle holder. I, Samantha Sumner, the hedge witch of Harrowick Woods, Hereby invoke your presence and call you forth from the spirit world. I offer you this vessel as an earthly binding to anchor your soul to the material plane. I offer you protection and shelter in return for your willing fealty as a familiar spirit. If you accept, heed my summons and come serve your lady. So mote it be. I knelt there, holding the tiny porcelain pumpkin in my lap, fearing with each passing second that I had done something wrong, or that even on Halloween in an astral nexus, I still wasn't powerful enough to summon a spirit to me. Samantha, Genevieve whispered, nodding her head behind me. I spun around and saw a humanoid astral form standing at the edge of the circle. Its features were ill-defined, 
and I wasn't sure if it was my friend or not. I ran to greet it, holding the candle container across the barrier so that it could touch it. It gingerly accepted, lightly placing its fingers upon it, and its features immediately solidified into those of my lost friend. I felt an instant psychic connection, just like the one I had with my cat, and I knew for certain that this was my friend, and that he was now safely bound to me and free of the underworld. He stood there in shocked silence. He never expected to see me again. He never expected to see Earth again. He stared at me, at the cemetery, at the sky, before finally letting out a barely audible but abundantly sincere thank you. Tears of joy running down my face, I threw my arms around him in an embrace more genial than anything we had shared while he was alive. I pulled him into my circle where we'd be safe until the wisps vanished at midnight. He was weeping now as well, a mix of joy, relief, gratitude, and confusion. Miss, he started. Samantha, I corrected him. You can call me Samantha now, Elam. Samantha, why? Why would you do this for me? He asked, as bewildered as he was thankful. I smirked incredulously, still somewhat confounded by the confusion that Genevieve, Persephone, and even the green man had presented at my determination to rescue Alam from the underworld. Because you're my friend, and I really don't understand why, or care that no one else seems to think that that's reason enough, I told him. You needed me and, I'm just sorry that it took me a whole year. Alam half laughed, half cried at my modest self-depreciation. A year is a hell of a lot less than the eternity I was expecting, he assured me. I can never repay you for this, Samantha. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. He was at a loss for words after that, the whole situation being understandably overwhelming. Genevieve and I just sat with him in our spell circle, taking turns telling him about everything we'd been through over the past year, indifferent to the waiting horde of wisps hovering just beyond our ward of salt and pumpkins. And... That's my story, and after having written it all down like this, I've come to the realization that it wasn't actually a horror story. Parts of it were horrifying, but in the end, I won. I uncovered arcane secrets about the spirit world, developed supernatural powers, made myself a home in a beautiful and hidden cemetery, found an amazing girlfriend, and bent the queen of the underworld to my will just to help out a friend. I came through this experience more content and confident than I'd ever been, and I wouldn't give that up for anything. Before all this happened, I considered myself an anti-nihilist. I believed that the lack of any objective meaning to the universe was a good thing, since it made everyone's subjective sense of meaning equally valid. That's why the existence of literal gods was so existentially horrifying to me at first. The idea that there were objective arbiters of meaning and morality, but one of those gods did something that I found immoral and I was able to get her to undo what she had done. Gods or not, I proved that mortals are not their playthings, that we still have some agency over our own fate, and to me, that's the exact opposite of horror. I've since learned through divination that Persephone did keep her word, and release Artaxerxes' descendants, and in particular that Alam's young daughter Rosemary was able to ascend to the Summerland. He's extremely happy about that as you can imagine, and he hopes to join her there one day. I hope he does too. For now though, he's content to serve as my faithful familiar, guarding me and Genevieve on our astral journeys and carrying out tasks I assign him. Otherwise, he comes and goes from the cemetery as he wills, but he's never failed to answer my summons. And in case you were thinking it, he's always been respectful of mine and Genevieve's privacy. As for me, I've started a new career as a part-time metaphysical counselor at Genevieve's Spiritual Wellness Center sharing my newfound expertise as a hedge witch with those who seek it. It's definitely not something I would have seen myself doing a couple of years ago, but so far it's been going well, even if I've been restricted to doing it over Zoom lately. It's especially nice being able to work alongside Genevieve. I never would have been able to save Alam without her, and I will be forever grateful for the guidance and love she gave me during a crucial time in my life. My life's actually been pretty mundane since last Halloween, but I don't expect that to last. Harrowick County can be a pretty weird place, and I know there are plenty more mysteries and anomalies left to find. Plus, now I have Arctaxerxes' final journal, the one filled with secrets he literally took to the grave. That obviously has a lot of potential I've yet to tap into, 
The story of how I became the hedge witch of Harrowick Woods may be over, but it certainly won't be the last story of mine at his side is worth telling.